Right, I don't have the sound. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes till it's 2.30 to get started. Thank you all for joining. We'll begin very shortly. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, we'll wait a couple of minutes to get started. Thank you all for joining. We'll begin very shortly. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to our online conference, How to Increase Employability in the MENA, Addressing uh, the Job Skills uh, Mismatch. This conference is organized by the Office of the Provost at AUB in collaboration with uh, Emerging. And uh, we will discuss here uh, in this conference from across perspectives of employers, of higher education institutions, but also of young professionals, how to bridge uh, the, the job skills mismatch in the region and how to equip our students uh, to the jobs of the future. So I'm very happy uh, to give the floor to President Fadlo Khouri, uh, who is the 16th president at the American University of Beirut and an accomplished uh, molecular, molecular and translational oncologist. Uh, since assuming his presidency at AUB, uh, he has increased uh, external and institutional support for students through new and expanded scholarship and financial aid programs. He has helped obtain grants and donations for underprivileged students and patients 
totaling over $250 million. And of course, our students have always been and remain highly employable in the region and beyond. Uh, so, Mr. President, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, uh, good morning uh, also to some friends, colleagues, partners from Lebanon, the region, and the world. Good afternoon for most, I suspect. Thank you for making this important conference happen, and thank you for inviting me. It's always, always a time, today more than ever, to consider the role that each one of us in our institutions can play in boosting employability and reducing the current job skills mismatch in the region. As I've said many times, the days when institutions could give degrees and wave bye-bye to their students are finished, particularly in a region in which is undergoing such turbulence as the MENA region. This region is at a critical junction. Even before the pandemic wreaked havoc on employment rates, youth employment has been miserable here. Youth unemployment's been at more than 25% for the last decade among the highest rates in the world. Moreover, nearly half of the population of the MENA region is under 24 years of age, where you have this bimodal and not particularly economically healthy distribution, meaning that the competition for jobs in the future will likely be even worse. Although access to education has improved at all levels in the region, much remains to be done in matching skills to needs in the job market and in preparing youth to enter the workforce, whether through higher education or through vocational training, something the region has particularly ignored. Ironically, just as the sheer number of youth in the region becomes a challenge to some, another major challenge is that the MENA region has one of the lowest rates of return of educated youth in the world. Unstable and non-inclusive economies, uneven, educational opportunities, lack of career paths, lack of participation in governance, poor job creation, all of these contribute to why so many of the best and brightest young people, having spent a couple of years abroad, elect not to return. These trends, I don't need to tell you, bode poorly for the long-term balance of our societies, and they're frankly unsustainable. But I, and I believe the vast majority of us at AUB believe that universities and experts like those gathered here today have a great deal to contribute in transforming the ecosystems and the dynamics of the region in such a manner that young people will increasingly elect to stay as well as hopefully return and to ensure that youth entering the work workforce are equipped with the right skills and competencies. At AUB, we recognize the urgency not just to ride the wave, but to further accelerate the wave of transformation, digitization, and innovation, while we also address fundamental societal and global challenges through education and knowledge creation. As a teaching-centered research university, AUB offers cutting-edge pedagogy of experiential learning and produces internationally recognized research. We collaborate with sister universities and industries worldwide through faculty student exchange programs, internships, mentorships, and various training uh, avenues. We also need to empower our students as we continuously attempt to do with a multitude of innovation and entrepreneurship programs that you're going to hear about today, because these are intended to help develop not just their creative ideas and support them in realizing their bold dreams for a better future, but in creating a more participatory series of ecosystems. In addition to graduating students who are academically prepared to enter the workforce, we feel it's just as critical to prepare them to be well-rounded global citizens and responsible, engaged servant leaders who can positively impact their communities as well as the world beyond. We have to put a stop to the constant brain drain of the best and brightest from this region and turn to educating agents of change who are not only qualified and confident, but who actually want to make a difference. We need to tap into that sense of citizenship and that sense of ownership of the region. In his address to the University of Pennsylvania in 1940, the 32nd president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 
most of us know him as FDR, spoke about the imperative to equip the younger generation with the knowledge, skills, and support necessary to make their world a better place. He said, and I quote, we cannot always build the future for our youth, but we can build our youth for the future. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about building a youth for a better future. While we're always enormously proud to be highly ranked in the Global Employability University Ranking and Survey, the truth is that for the good of the country and the region, we would welcome seeing more Lebanese and regional universities rise in the ranking in this most important of areas. This is an area of collaboration rather than competition. Or as my friend Yusuf Asfour told me recently, a collaboration and competition that merge together as the term was uh, brought forward in the 80s. The gathering of industry experts, higher education leaders, regional employers, and young professionals that we've got today, and I want to thank the Provost's Office and Dr. Afuni and Dr. Shwedi for bringing this together, is significant and it could not possibly be more timely. The world is changing very quickly, and it's our duty to listen to its needs and collaborate together on the best ways to cater to this new reality. That makes our meeting today even more significant even more timely, even more urgent. I wanted to close by thanking you all for your efforts and sincere partnership towards a better future for our youth and the advancement of our region. The youth and the people of this region deserve it. Now we need to get to work and help develop, as Roosevelt once said, help build our youth for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, President Khoury. Uh, it is indeed a good time for collaboration, and I'm very happy to have a wonderful uh, panel of speakers and uh, panelists for the roundtable discussion from different countries in the region. I mean, this is a regional event uh, with the representation from multiple countries in the region, but also representation from higher education, uh, from employers, and from uh, young professionals as well. Um, so now uh, I'm going to give the floor to Dean Alan Shahadi, who is uh, the Dean of the Maroon Saman Faculty of Engineering and Architecture at the American University of Beirut. And he is leading a very interesting initiative focused on digitization of learning and reintegrating human centered design uh, in STEM and broadening access to education. Uh, so I'm very eager to hear uh, the, the presentation and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fida. Uh, and thank you all for inviting me today. It's an honor to be here with this uh, distinguished panel. And uh, I'm seeing many friends that I haven't seen in quite a while. I was just browsing uh, the attendee list. So I'm glad to see you all virtually. Um, I'm going to share my content. I promised Fida would do a few slides. So just start with that. Fida, are you seeing my slides now? All right, wonderful. So I was tasked with uh, the question, how does higher education boost employability in the region? And I felt that, that the word how should be in parentheses and it could be a question, does higher education boost employability in the, re in the region? And so th this was kind of the theme around which I prepared a few slides really with the intention uh, to spark a conversation. So. I don't have uh, a final answers here for you, but I will point out a couple of uh, things for context. So uh, there's two questions really to this. Uh, it's one is on employment. Uh, is there enough employment? And the other is on employability. Do we train people uh, to get their first jobs and to have upward social mobility? Um, in the MENA region, 31% of the youth are unemployed. Um, it's similar numbers to what President Fudi just uh, mentioned. And 30 percent, uh, there's a 30 percent unemployment rate among youth with university degrees. So right away, we see a problem there, which is that having a university degree doesn't seem to improve one's employment opportunities. Um, if we look to Lebanon, uh, zoom in a little bit on Lebanon, we have about 200,000 youth enrolled in universities here in this country. Um, and in a good year, 5,000 jobs are created annually. So there's clearly a big gap, uh, not just in how we're training them, but what are we training them for when they finish 
So this is a question I always like to keep in mind as we're going through our own educational reforms. Now, AUB somehow seems to escape this fate. We're uh, ranked in, in various rankings. We're always in, among the top universities in the world in graduate employability. We have extremely high ratings for uh, graduate outcomes. Uh, if you look at them five years out, they're doing very well. They do very well in getting their first job very quickly out of uh, the university or before they graduate. And employers have a high, uh, a high opinion of our uh, graduates. So I want to start with just asking the question, maybe reframing the first question, how does AUB boost employability? And then we'll go to the broader region. So AUB, I would say, has four uh, secrets to its, its recipes. It's, one is relevance and partnerships. Two is liberal learning. Three is student experience. And four is having putting research grade faculty in front of our students. So let me talk about the first three. But before I do, I'll just mention that these add up to a pretty expensive proposition. It's a, it's a, it's a very high value, but also a high cost uh, operation. And there are other alternatives coming in, into play, which I think we'll hear about uh, later today. So starting with relevance and partnerships, I'm going to zoom in even further on the Faculty of Engineering uh, as it was founded in 1951. It was founded uh, in partnership really with the major companies that were developing the oil resources of the Arab Gulf. And they recognized, as did AUB, that uh, this was an opportunity for AUB to work with companies on develop, providing the talent that would develop those resources in the Arab Gulf. And so we had major uh, partnerships with the Bechtel Corporation, the building I'm presenting uh, to you from today is named the Bechtel Building. Uh, it also involved the Arabian American Oil Company, which later became or became known as Aramco, the Kuwait Oil Company, and others. And the other, the other major uh, impetus for forming the Faculty of Engineering was to help governments in the region as they were doing their modernization projects. This was at a time when electrification was just coming on board. The south of Lebanon still didn't have electricity. And once again, of course, we don't have electricity, but that's another, another story. Uh, but it was also a time when we were developing infrastructure, uh, dams, roads, and so on. So that was the relevance at the time this faculty was founded. Um, and it was very much tied to uh, a project, a strategic project in the region. And that ensured employability. Now, we obviously haven't remained there, but uh, I'll come back to that. So the second ingredient I mentioned was the liberal learning model. AUB was founded um, on the liberal learning model. The Faculty of Arts and Sciences, in fact, was the first uh, faculty on campus that, and it, it provided the spine for all of our professional programs. So even the Faculty of Engineering, before it started, it was offering a civil engineering degree through the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And we've always recognized that liberal learning is super important. Um, and let me just contrast it. Uh, sorry, I jumped ahead here. So I want to contrast professional education to a liberal education. On, a, on the professional education side, we ask questions like we're asking today. What kind of job uh, am I being prepared for? How does one do something? What skills do I acquire? Um, I look at intelligence and mastery of knowledge. So mostly a professional education focuses on acquisition of skills and the ability to deploy those skills. So it's really an external thing. Um, a liberal education asks a different set of questions, like not just what kind of job, but what kind of life do I want to live? Uh, instead of only the how questions, the why questions, the critical thinking, uh, wisdom as opposed to intelligence, mastery of self rather than mastery of knowledge that's external. And this liberal education, if you think about it, really is um, the future proofing of any individual that allows someone to adapt, it allows to, them to empathize, it allows them to put themselves in, in the shoes of other people, and also to ask the bigger questions of why are we doing what we're doing. Um, at AUB, we've made it as a, a priority that anyone going through a professional education is also liberally educated. We spend, uh, in the engineering uh, uh, programs, they have an entire year uh, equivalent of humanities and social science courses so that they come out uh, with uh, that kind of uh, translatable um, view on the world. So that's the second ingredient. The third ingredient is student experience. Um, I'm showing you here, not a rock concert, but a, an image from something called AUB Outdoors. This is an event that's put together by students uh, every year. Uh, it attracts 20,000 people to the AUB campus over a two-day event. 
Uh, it involves 400 students that uh, work over the entire year to put this event on. And, and it, it's an event that has uh, all kinds of um, activities for the participants, which are students and non-students alike. It, it's set up as a corporation, as a company with a CEO, and uh, they learn how to work in teams, uh, cross-disciplinary teams, as they put this um, high stakes event on every year. And, and it's, uh, it always has to outdo the previous year. But we also have other kinds of student experiences, which uh, sometimes involve directly engaging the context. Uh, as you all have heard of the Beirut port explosion on August 4, uh, which devastated a very large swath of the city uh, in a large residential neighborhood. We immediately um, put our in, uh, structural engineering teams into action. Uh, that means uh, experienced faculty members taking teams of students to inspect buildings to advise residents whether the building they're in is safe or not safe. And that's just one example of many that I could give of experiential learning and really um, learning in context. Because when a student comes back from an experience like that, they see their civil engineering or structural engineering course in an entirely new light. Um, we're also uh, have been focusing a lot on redesigning student learning spaces, not only outside the university, but inside the university walls. I think this image here is very familiar to you. It could have been in 2018. It could have been in 1918. It could have been in 1818. It's the same exact model and uh, in probably the same psychological state. You can look at the students in that image and you can see that they're uh, kind of daring the instructor to see if they can learn anything from them. Um, we transform these kinds of experiences into more hands-on experiences, particularly uh, given the competition that's happening uh, in the region and beyond with online learning. So the image on the left is really uh, a faculty member in a broadcast mode, very little engagement by the student. One could just as easily do that through a taped video lecture and would have a, essentially the same value. So if we're going to be uh, charging high tuition, and if we're going to be bringing students onto campus and put them face to face with research grade faculty, we should be doing more things that are on the right, which are teamwork, coaching, uh, an entirely different uh, kind of student experience. Uh, so I'll, I'll just mention a few things about repositioning uh, engineering and AUB. Uh, Fida, how am I on time? How much time do I have? Uh, you're good. We still have 10 um, minutes. Great. Okay, I'll take I'll take three and then open it up for discussion. We have been repositioning the engineering school, but this is happening across AUB as well. I'm only going to take the engineering school since I'm most familiar with it. Uh, what you see in red are our educational programs, um, our residential programs, which up until now have really occupied the majority of this pie chart. Uh, but moving forward, we're shrinking uh, the relative size of the res uh, the residential programs by increasing our open learning footprint and our partnerships, our partnerships with other companies uh, and having them think of AUB as an open loop university, one that uh, which students at various times in their career circle back to again and again. Um, we've been implementing, and then we have on the left-hand side, the blue, which is really uh, research, uh, research and development work. And I'll just kind of explain how these things come together through some of our uh, new initiatives and new hubs. We have the Al Hurair Hub for Digital Teaching and Learning at MSFEA, which is really our open learning platform. Uh, this hub is responsible for putting 120 uh, of our engineering and architecture courses online in the next three years. We have more than a dozen programs uh, that are already in design. We have a fully online master's degree already launched and several diploma programs that are already launched through the hub. Now, what's interesting about this is that the hub uh, interfaces with something new called the Institute at MSFEA, which is really our industrial outreach arm. The Institute has two main goals. One is uh, that it, it develops relationships with companies uh, for research and development purposes so that we can help uh, contribute to the sustainability and competitiveness of the enterprises in, in the Arab region and the MENA region, but also beyond. Um, and secondly, it also uh, works on partnerships with companies on HR functions. So a lot of, uh, say, the civil engineers that graduated from AUB in 2000 may know nothing about or may have learned nothing about art artificial intelligence. And today that's a core part of their business. So why not come back to AUB uh, for additional training? So that's one of the things that we're doing through the Institute and the hub together. 
Um, we have a lot of projects already started. I just kind of mentioned a couple there, but let me go on for the sake of time. Um, so these two things link together because a lot of times the companies are uh, remotely located. They may be, uh, they are uh, mid-career professionals oftentimes who cannot leave everything they're doing to come to AUB for a couple of years. So uh, the content gets uh, developed by the Rare Hub for Digital Teaching and Learning uh, in collaboration with the companies that the Institute has brought to campus one way or the other. And we can, we can uh, customize our curricula uh, for the particular needs of those companies. One, one example is Petrofac. We recently also uh, uh, connected with LinkedIn. Now we have an agreement with LinkedIn and several other universities as well. The Petrofac um, program, I'll just mention it uh, because it's one that um, it provides a good example. Um, in this program, we had 100 uh, engineers over a two-year period enroll, from, enroll in a master's in engineering management. So these are mid-career engineers that are much more involved in, in project management. Uh, so we, we arranged with Petrofac to customize the curricula, uh, particularly for their new business areas, which are in renewable energy, which are very aligned with the mission and vision of this faculty. So we were training uh, 100 of their engineers in this domain. We had the first cohort graduate uh, this summer, and we have the next cohort already in place. We're doing this kind of thing with several companies. This is the first one to actually be executed through completion, but there are other companies as well that we're engaging. Um, uh, regarding uh, research and development uh, and reaching out to uh, companies, we had one project, one program for small and medium sized enterprises uh, to uh, get a grant through our endowment for engaging our faculty in some of the research challenges that they have. This is just an advertisement that we had put out on LinkedIn. Um, but one of the projects that came through uh, and was actually quite a success story in the, in the context of COVID-19 was Lebanon's first uh, EU rated surgical mask. Uh, this project uh, involved Indevco or, or was led by the Indevco group or the makers of the Sanita brand of consumer products in Lebanon. Uh, using locally sourced materials, we were able to, with them, uh, repurpose a diaper production line into a line that produces uh, the only uh, EU rated surgical masks uh, in Lebanon. And interestingly, that project went from concept to actual market. I'm showing you the first boxes that went to the grocery stores or the pharmacies, I should say, um, in June of 2020 in nine weeks. So let's uh, jump now to uh, the last slide. And hopefully this is one to provoke uh, some conversation. How is higher ed changing in the NINA? Um, I've kind of identified here three different groups, agile insurgents, uh, incumbents with transformative student experiences and the rest. So agile insurgents, which we'll hear from at least 3W today, I know is on one of the panels. Uh, there are many, um, many people that have walked into the space that's been left by higher education in general, where higher ed has become expensive or uh, is producing less relevant curricula uh, than what is needed by the market. So at a low cost point, um, people like Gaza Sky Geeks, 42 Abu Dhabi and 3W uh, have jumped into that space with low cost, high relevance programs that can be delivered using digital technology at scale and at a low cost. Um, they're giving a lot of people um, in the traditional education sector uh, a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, then there are incumbents, uh, people like AUB, who have transformative student experiences. And the challenge for us right now is to do what, you, what the agile insurgents can't do, which is uh, have or can't do as well, I should say, do the things that cannot be done at distance, but do them extremely well. And so I highlighted some of the kinds of student experiences that we're, that we're engaging now, but also to mention that uh, one of the ways we do that is by leveraging digital technology. In other words, having uh, lecture material provided online so that when you're in person, you can do much higher value uh, exercises. So um, I will stop there and open it up for questions. And thank you again for inviting me today. Thank you, Dean Shadid. This is so inspirational, really, to see uh, how you're putting in action uh, 
the, the spirit of the liberal education and providing the, this kind of student experience that is not only beneficial to the students, but also helps uh, solve problems in the community. Uh, this is really impressive. I just want to inform the audience that uh, you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question directly and then I can unmute you or you can type your question in the Q&A uh, section. Any questions or comments to uh, Dinesh Hadid? Yeah, I think you were perfectly clear. People need time to process uh, this information. This is really uh, great. Um, so if there are no questions, I'll give you one last second, uh, the last chance to ask a question. Okay, then uh, uh, we will move to, uh, thank you, Dean Shahad, uh, very much. Um, thank you. Uh, we will uh, move to, uh, uh, I'll move to introduce uh, uh, Ms. Rana, Mrs. Rana Ghandur Salhab, who is, uh, who will present from the perspective of one of the uh, leading employers in the region, which is Deloitte uh, Middle East. Uh, so Rana is the people and purpose partner at Deloitte Middle East and a member of the Regional Executive Committee. Uh, she oversees talent diversity and inclusion, brand and communications, corporate responsibility and sustainability. Uh, she is responsible for over 22 offices in 16 countries in the region. And uh, she is uh, a, an award winner and highly recognized for her trailblazing role in the region uh, as a, um, one of the top five global champions of women in business, which is granted by the Financial Times. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, Rana and I'm going to first um, unmute you and uh, share the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Fida. Thank you, AUB and the Provost Office uh, for actually inviting me to be part of this very important conference. I'm honored to be here because uh, AUB is my alma mater and I cannot remember any time in my uh, life, uh, seemingly, and my full career that I haven't been involved in one capacity or another with AUB, either as a student, a graduate, uh, a mother of a student, uh, a speaker, uh, sitting on, on boards and uh, other things. So uh, AUB appears to be in my blood. Uh, also, as Deloitte, we look at AUB and uh, the MENA leading universities as sources for talent for us. Frankly, we cannot survive in this region as leading companies or even as companies at all, had it not been for your product, your talent. So what am I going to do today? Dr. Khoury and Dr. Shadi spoke about uh, the unemployment of youth and graduates. I will speak about the race for talent. What you're worried about and that people are not finding jobs, we're worried about and uh, not sleeping at night about finding the people we need uh, to meet our business strategies and to grow our companies. Uh, what the educators today on the call should expect from me is to understand our challenges. I will give you a glimpse of the types of challenges we're facing. I, I, I would have liked to say the post-COVID era, but I wish it's not post-COVID yet, but definitely at this point in time. How we're looking at the world of work, what is keeping us up at night, what are the leaders in the business world uh, are saying across the world, and I have a couple of findings and pieces that I'd like to share. Also, what are your recent graduates, the Z generation, the, uh, the millennials are saying, and how are they finding the, the word of work? And more importantly, what they're demanding from us as employers to continue to work in our companies. And that is one of the biggest challenges. Many of you may have heard about the great resignation now. I'll, I'll speak briefly about that, although to a certain extent, it is beginning to knock on our shores here in the MENA region, but not fully as it is in the US and some parts of Europe. Uh, I cannot dissociate our topic of employability uh, from the future of work. And Fida, I'm going to bother you a lot in uh, going to the next slide, please. Uh, the future of work 
is no longer the future of work. And before I tackle this topic, I'd like to see uh, to show you this a uh, couple of minutes video uh, just to uh, preempt and start the discussion. So, how do you find your ideal clients between 8 billion people? Imagine the future of work. What do you see? Do you see factories full of robots and offices teeming with AI? Do you predict that changing demographics will rewrite the rules of who works and how long? Do you anticipate the rise of a global gig economy where most people are working for themselves? All of these scenarios are emerging, but looking at them in isolation misses the point. We need to zoom out and see the big picture. Evolving technology, demographics, and power dynamics are all connected, and those connections make all the difference in the future of work. If intelligent machines can do many tasks now performed by people, what uniquely human skills will be valued? If the half-life of skills necessary for employment continues to dwindle, how can individuals, employers, and society as a whole ensure the learning modules and the education system keep up? As the global workforce gets older, younger, and more diverse, how will leaders and organizational culture have to adapt? If alternative work arrangements like short-term gigs and self-employment become more ubiquitous and mainstream, could that have profound effects on not just how we work, but where we work, how we communicate, and even how cities are designed? If augmented reality gives workers access to vast amounts of data and assistance, will workers need to become more tech-fluent for the technology to deliver on its promise? The future of work is coming. In some cases, it's already here. It's time to get to work. This is not an ad, so I don't want uh, to promote Deloitte, although uh, we're doing a lot of research on this very topic, the future of work, education, the tie, and so on. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please, uh, Fida? What has happened this past year? COVID, past year and a half, I would say, and almost coming to two years, COVID was like a time machine. We had predicted the future of work to have a certain format. We predicted the contingency workforce. We predicted many things to come in 10 years. They came in one year. And all companies and uh, educational institutions had to move on and, uh, and adapt. Uh, organizations, workers have proven that they are capable of tremendous resilience as, uh, under pressure. For example, upgrading technology was never needed as much to ensure people stayed connected. And, and I would say there's still a race to, to do that. Technology fluency became imperative. People had to unlearn ways of working. It wasn't that the content of work has changed, how we work. So they had to unlearn and learn to address the shifting work and market requirements. Uh, people's choices have changed when they came out of the, uh, of the crisis or are beginning to come out and work uh, uh, in a hybrid form format at present. So from seeing all of that, our focus was to look at organizations which are thriving, not organizations which are surviving. And we looked at this and we I will share with you in a few minutes what thriving organizations have as features. And these thriving organizations are those who decided to uh, that disruption uh, is continuous and that it is not a one-time event. They had to act fast, they had to adapt their working modules, and more importantly, they had to focus on people. Can we move, please? 
before I talk about what uh, the businesses are saying, and business leaders and the millennial generation, uh, Fida asked me specifically to be to talk about MENA market trends. What are we seeing? Are we really seeing a war for talent? Are we seeing a race for talent? Is it a perception or reality? It actually Fida depends on what sector you are in. In my sector, there is a lot of talk in every meeting about the war for talent. So I've Put a few thoughts here, and there are probably in your minds many, many others, but I'd like to take each one of them for a cup for a few comments. Post COVID, there is a very strong recovery. So those companies who put their people on furloughs or put at fire en masse, so to speak, in the market are now being asked to hire. So the most important uh, team in my company now are the recruiters. We're developing them, we're giving them technology, we're giving them tools, we're making deals with LinkedIn to access uh, the, the pockets of talent and headhunt and so on. So this strong recovery has really, really impacted all organizations and they're rushing to find the right people. It is, ladies and gentlemen, a candidate market for the talented candidates who are either lateral hires, what we call lateral hire, experienced talent, but even to a certain lesser extent to graduates, they can choose where to go rather than we are choosing them. We have never had, and I'm talking not about Deloitte, all the sector and other companies. Uh, by the way, I'm sitting here now in Dubai, uh, about 10 weeks, uh, 10 days ago, Two weeks I was in Riyadh and next week I'm going to be in Beirut. So I'm getting first hand taste of the types of challenges uh, uh, that, that the market is having. And the candidate market means that the companies who are leading and choosing the top talent are seeing a rejection rate that has never been, um, that is unprecedented. Uh, in India, I heard this yesterday, uh, in some companies out of every 100 that are accepting jobs, 30% don't show up on the first day of work. In the interim between hiring them and having them come to work, they are finding uh, better uh, employment opportunities. This is unusual and it is uh, uh, really uh, keeping people at night, if you like. Uh, there has been a turn around in employment. Many people, and that's where the great resignation is happening, are choosing to go to the gig economy and sell their services to companies or sometimes exit the workforce and do other things. So we predicted in my firm that in about 2030, 30% of our workers will be in a contingent workforce. In some pockets in Europe and the US, we're beginning to see more need for us because we're not going to find all these people to be employed. We're just going to have to contract them. And how, what do you do about contraction? What is the relationship? How do you manage your risk? How do you manage loyalty? And, and, and. what systems? We're discussing a system today. It's going to cost us millions just to uh, manage manage the contingent workforce. Flexibility is in high demand, and I will not speak too much about that. I'll speak about it in a couple of minutes, because the demand from employees on flexibility is amazing. Yesterday in a meeting, I stopped in the middle of a meeting and I asked everybody, define flexibility, because for some younger people, it's just about doing what they want. For us, flexibility is you, there are measures and guidelines. So this is a big, big matter. Well-being and more focused is mental well-being. Mental well-being or mental health was never an employer's responsibility. Now at every corner, it's part of the package to, to give your employees uh, the uh, facilities, the assistance program, employee assistance program, and so on for mental well-being. There is a lot of risk we're saying. So will my uh, managers be able to discuss mental well-being with employees? Shouldn't specialists do that? And there is now a gray area of where an employer plays. A uh, re-articulation again and again and again of the employee value proposition. Uh, this is a favorite word these days of articulation and why should pay people choose or stay in companies in the Middle East and everywhere. The hot sectors, you probably, many of you know more about this, but of course there's a shortage in cyber, there's a shortage in digital. We're not finding the right talent. We're having to recruit from across uh, countries, bring them from other uh, regions of the world. And uh, if, if I were at AUB and in engineering and elsewhere, 
let uh, I would ask all my students to focus on digital and cyber and artificial intelligence and all these things. It, they are data, data science, and so on and so forth. They're highly in demand. And the gig economy, I mentioned it a little bit. It is a reality. It is something we uh, really need to work for. So if we move, please, uh, Fida. These are my three W's. I'm not the three W Academy that Dr. Shadi spoke about in the engineering school. The, the, uh, uh, some of all these challenges are, uh, I'd put them into, uh, we're putting them at Deloitte into uh, three buckets, uh, the work, the activities and, and uh, uh, technology, you change that the workforce and the workplace. The workforce on the combination of all the skills and talents, and we're focusing on that, the people, and what to offer and how to reskill and de-skill and what have you, and the workplace. I'll, uh, if you look behind me, just as a curiosity, I'm gonna move. This is our Deloitte Dubai Digital Center. It is a very strange space. It's got all sorts of screens and things. And instead of having people sit on desk, I'm sitting on a high desk on a stool, and behind me is a simulation of a commercial space where our clients can go in with technology and stuff, simulate how it is to shop and the experience of the shopper for retail companies. We are repurposing our offices across the world and as many other companies are doing because we're going to have less people in the workforce because of the hybrid work thing. So we are not going at least uh, to reduce our offices. We're going to use them in different places. And that is part of the workplace and part of talking about uh, the physical design of work. Fida? Uh, can we move? Yeah. So I promised you to tell you what business leaders are going to uh, uh, are saying. We have a human capital survey, which we've been doing uh, for a trends, human capital trends survey. If you go to the next page, and I'm going to give you the latest data uh, that we have. So uh, we surveyed 6,000 people in, in 2021 now from 99 countries. And in fact, this the da data is very relevant to us because 45% of the respondents were from the MENA region. The theme that came out, and I'm gonna explain it in a couple of slides, is that the companies that are thriving are, are working on remaining distinctly human. And that is excellent news for educational institutions because the focus is not on machines as much as uh, all that technology is important. The differentiator for successful companies based on 6,000 business and HR leaders is the human element. It's not even different ways of thinking and acting. It's literally looking at things uh, completely differently. Let's uh, move please with that. So the top priority for organization, and there's a market, uh, I can see that uh, the engineering school and AUB is already tapping on training people who are in the workforce. The top priority is the ability of their people to adapt, reskill, assume new roles. And the good news for you, the bad news for me, is only 17% of organizations think they are very ready to do that. The second priority, 25% only feel they are ready to organize and manage uh, work in a way that facilitates rapid decision making. So there is room uh, for us both consulting firms to advise these companies on how to do this better. Uh, Fida? I, I'm gonna share only two or three themes here and I put a bit on a MENA scoop. So I uh, give you an example or two. Last year trend was uh, more on uh, designing the work, restructuring the work to help workers not uh, work at their best, perform at their best. The theme in 2021 is very different. The focus is not on how they will work at their best. The focus is to let them feel that they have well-being, uh, that they're well taken care of, uh, that they uh, we are differentiators in the offerings we give them and and and. So the left hand side is still a focus, but a lesser focus. And so there is much more focus on the individual, the human element. And there are many and many examples from uh, the ones that are happening across the region. I happen to know the, U uh, the uh, GCC countries a bit more, but I'm sure there are plenty around. Fida? 
The second theme, it's last year's trend was around reskilling, but this year's trend is around empowering workers with agency. Choice is all the way a time made. A choice in value. A, don't go to prescriptive approaches as much. Afford the workers the agency and choice to, to explore their passion areas and, and, and. A completely different focus. The business priorities are now around uh, filling the skills need, but but getting agency and having the workers be part of that formula. And again, on the MINA scoop, uh, uh, I, I'll give you a couple of examples at the end, what we're doing ourselves at Deloitte, but uh, there is an emphasis on digital learning, on blended learning, frankly, because we're beginning to get complaints about death by e-learning. So we're, we're just reshifting and, and moving on. Next, please. Theme three. Organizations last year were uh, uh, talking about bold decisions around critical human capital risk opportunity. This year, it is a, a shift to using the workforce insights. We, I, uh, we are now beginning to talk about survey fatigue because we keep on going, and um, not only us, all the market keep on going survey and assessing and engagement surveys and spot surveys and uh, check surveys and so on. So. Uh, we're seeing less interest from workers, but because sometimes we're working in the blind, we're really trying to focus groups and we're seeing people vote with their feet and leaving the workforce and the organizations. How do we keep them in? And not, uh, next to that. So. I'm done with some insights of what the leaders are doing. I would like to go a little bit on the millennials and Gen Z, and uh, they're already at about 80% in my organization across the Middle East and Deloitte. So let's see what they said in a survey, uh, which is the 10th year we run this survey across the, the world. So we had 14,655 millennials and 8,000 some Gen Z, so in total 22,000 or 23,000 people from 45 countries, which include the Middle East. And you can begin to look at the trends. 25% of them, they would like to work less in the office. You can't force them to come to offices anymore. And uh, there are plenty of things companies are doing around that. Uh, and it, it, in a, it's like a normal curve, someone to work in the office, someone to work at home, and someone the flexibility to decide themselves, pretty much normal distribution. And why, what are they seeing as the most critical uh, characteristics or what type of flexibility, flexibility, adaptability, talk, creativity, technology, and you can see many, many other, their responses as the most important employee characteristics that they would like to find in organizations. I'll send these slides uh, later on. Uh, Frida? Another insight. I keep on talking about well-being. I'm making you sick of it. But uh, it is absolutely being repeated everywhere, especially women, and especially because they are the caretakers and they are the most sufferers from the COVID era and, and, and. 44% uh, of millennials uh, felt stressed all or most of the time. That's a scary number. Hence, there is all that uh, that discussion around it. Uh, Fida, the next slide on the right, please. The next. Uh, why are you stressed? A whole series of things from the financial future to uncertainty over the pandemic and 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 this was um, I can't remember the exact date we had, uh, we finished the survey, but this is the set of things that came out as their top priority, the welfare of my family, the social political climate, the physical mental health, and all of these things. Thank you for that. And the bad news for us is that they are less likely to be loyal. So we saw a drop in the loyalty of companies, uh, for companies actually, if you look at it from 2016 to 2021, especially in the millennial generation. Uh, uh, and, and you can see the trends between 2020 and 2021. I would expect next year we'll see possibly lower numbers, but let, that's my prediction uh, perhaps if we talk again. Thank you. So what are my takeaways from all of this? We have to acknowledge the impact on working mothers from the survey. 
that was one of our takeaways. Reevaluate the way organization uh, will promote diversity and inclusion. Examine the role of business in supporting employees. So their top priority is not my career future plan. It's really handling the stress and the economic uncertainty and all of that. Uh, ensure that the environment doesn't fall back to the list of priorities that we predicted before and probably some are being still taught at universities bring in the blend because they will come back but still there's a shift and lastly uh, prioritize mental health i've said it many times i won't say it again my last intake uh, uh, Topic today is I'd like to speak about a project we're doing. We're calling it hybrid words. We're asking our people to come to the offices, go to clients under what we call as purposeful presence. They have choice to come, but we definitely build it around these principles. Definitely client focused. It's not the third on the uh, in ranking, but also it is people centric. If we don't this do this, we will not be able to retain people because they want to travel less. We're a consultancy. We travel all the time. They want to have more control over their lives. And this is a program which we issued. We just mentioned it in a press release last week, but we're going to put out more about it. We're focusing on what is called moments that matter. What are the moments that you need to be with the team and stay with the team, whether at a client or here in the offices, and which groups need Need to be more present. Some people we hire, some people for performance issues, and so on. When do you need to be with them? And we have a long, restrictive uh, list of guidelines around this. And the last thing, um, I think that's the last slide. Uh, just thought to give you an insight into at least what I'm. Uh, uh, we're worried about. We're now looking at days we're calling collective disconnect, closing the offices so people could disconnect. Because if you give leave they still get emails so that work-life balance we're seeing how we can integrate it in times of the year we're looking at family support elderly parent support that was never very much focused on and family support a series of things well-being allowances to buy computers at home desks and chairs and what have you and a whole series uh, a lot under education allowance support uh, it's jumping and skyrocketing and uh, today i was i was looking crunching the numbers with the teams so we have to work on that and the others i have mentioned before thank you very much for listening to me uh, today Thank you so much, uh, Rana, for these great insights. And uh, I was thinking that uh, maybe we're doing a very good job uh, at the university at uh, training our students, empowering them, pampering them, taking care of their well being, that uh, they come to you <laughs> and they ask for all of these things. That's uh, something interesting uh, to keep in mind. Uh, oh. Yeah. So um, we will have this uh, cross perspective of employers and universities in the roundtable discussion uh, later on. Thank you. I'm going to uh, uh, open it up to questions. If anybody would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and uh, then I can unmute you. Okay, I don't see any raised hands, so uh, I'm going to uh, move to our uh, last. Uh, Lina, Lina, you're raising your hand. Oh. I saw a raised hand, so I'm just. Uh, it's uh, Hamza Bach or something like that, and we have other people who have raised their hands on okay, the chat. Yeah, I don't know why for some reason it's delaying. Okay, thank okay. you. Uh, Hamza, please. alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, it was super insightful. Um, I am glad. Um, can you hear me well? Yeah. Do you hear me well? No, not very well. I'm afraid, uh, Hamza. Now is better than okay. last. Okay. Is this better? Yes. Okay, cool. Assalamu alaikum. I, I just wanted first to thank you very much. Um, it was super insightful. Um, 
uh, I feel that in, in, in my ecosystem, actually in Morocco, uh, a lot of even HR directors uh, are not aware of what you just said in your presentation. Uh, I mean, uh, let's not even talk about like uh, students in higher ed or even higher ed institutions. I feel that uh, orientation and sensitive and like advocacy of these ideas is something super crucial uh, today in our ecosystems. And my question was, uh, who is responsible for this advocacy? Who is doing that right now? And how could we help uh, the whole ecosystem um, bring these ideas into consciousness, uh, both in at the HR level, uh, HR leadership level, and in higher ed institutions? Look, these uh, these findings and these ideas are there because uh, our, our attempts to find out what the issues the uh, the organization could be facing, or if it's a piece of research like some of the data I did today, is to find out what are the trends in the market. And maybe in your country uh, there are some that are not problems at present. Now uh, there are some challenges my colleagues in the states are facing that haven't knocked on our shores, but because my leaders here, the leaders, my partners, uh, attend all sorts of calls. They panic and they say, blah, 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 we're losing. And then we come out and bring out statistics to show, no, 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 our focus is slightly different. This could be the reason, uh, but I promise you, some of what I said will come to your shores, uh, not only as problems, okay. but also as uh, areas that will need addressing. It's just a different uh, uh, momentum and different challenges across the world. And also it depends on the sector. There is a war for talent in certain sector and there is access uh, uh, access supply in other sectors. Uh, I can speak fairly well about the professional services sector, the financial sector, the the, air, the, the technology, the types of people we're hiring to, to work with our uh, clients on their economic policy and their technology on, on, on. Uh, so my answer is, uh, it's difficult to answer your question beyond saying, I think uh, some of these, if they prove to be time, uh, uh, not time sensitive, they continue to be challenges, they come to, to everybody, they'll come to the shores. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have a question from uh, Dana. I'm going to unmute. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dana, I'm a graduate and I'm an MHRM graduate. Uh, my question is, we were talking about the big resignation, and I'm thinking today when we revisit HR practices and uh, we reach this um, equality between people w wanting to work from home or people wanting to work from the office. So maybe if we have this, um, we revamp our practices or we approach it in a more fair way, could we minimize these resignations or the, the will to resign from a company? Dana, I think I got the gist of your question. I'm conscious of time, so I'll be quick. Uh, actually, your generation is forcing us to rethink all of that. I do not believe people should work out of their home all the time. They can go into the gig economy and uh, sell their services, but this is a different sector in the market. For the people who, who work here, we cannot condone working completely, and not because of what our clients need, because it's not good for the person themselves. It's not good to, to, to build teams properly. It's not good to even have skills like uh, watching people in a meeting, understanding them, team building, coaching, all of this. So our chosen method is hybrid work. But if I, I hear you rightly, I would like mothers to have that flexibility. I would like everybody to have flexibility, but more people in seasons of their life can partake of this flexible arrangement, the hybrid work, that to continue to have careers and to continue to really benefit the organization because selfishly we invest in them until they reach that stage. And so for those talented, we'd like to have them. Uh, some of the things I've said today are findings or predictions and they will become more and more. I predict myself personally that the organizations who get 
flexibility right while meeting client needs while meeting employee expectations will be those who will have differentiators be employers of choice and be more successful in their market have the right diversity the right inclusion culture and so on this is the formula for successful organizations in my viewpoint so yes you can work in such organization because you're forcing us to make our organizations uh, as such uh, I see two more questions uh, from Maha. Uh, I'm going to want to unmute. And then Rima. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dean Shahade. Very, very insightful. My question is question. It's about the data you shared about uh, loyalty or retention of employees, uh, Rena. And I wonder whether the data accounts for types of organizations, because we've seen many of our graduates opting to work in NGOs or foundations with social purpose. Even our graduates who opt for uh, entrepreneurship are, uh, are um, very mindful of engaging in social entrepreneurship opportunities. And I wonder whether, and I hope <laughs> that the new generation is also um, less willing to, um, uh, you know, uh, engage time and effort uh, in, in, a, in a drastic way when they do not feel um, connection with the purpose of the organization. Thank you. Very, very, uh, very timely comment, Maha. Uh, at the human capital trend survey I just shared, I think last year's version was around purposeful organization, uh, organizations, that if your organization does not have a purpose that aligns with sustainability, with a certain purpose or an articulation, and that it's not in the DNA of the firm, again, they will choose, with, they will vote with their boots and their feet, and they will leave you, the generations we want to attract. That's why they're going to NGOs. That's why they're working in, uh, uh, would, uh, are demanding from organizations to be purposeful. I, my role, is people and purpose. I mean, this may sound strange, but we are now having, I'm like the purpose officer in my organization. I have a purpose council that is a representation from partners from all businesses. We're looking at bringing a purpose. Our purpose is impact that matters. Uh, that's how we articulated, but under it, many principles and stuff. We're bringing it in the company we keep, suppliers. We are mandating suppliers to meet certain uh, rules before we ask them. We're bringing it into the bidding process when we uh, agree uh, to, to take on clients or propose to clients and so on. And absolutely, you're right, the findings are that these generations want to work for purposeful organizations. And they can be commercial purposeful organizations, not only NGOs. Thank you. Uh... Ranas, we'll move to the last, que last question for the sake of time uh, with uh, Rima. Please go ahead, Rima. Thank you very much, Rana, for this uh, insightful presentation. Um, I benefited a lot. Um, and I'm glad that uh, Dean Shahadi is still on board. I tell you that I heard once a high-ranking official from Schlumberger saying, we, uh, if we are to recruit engineers from the region, we will only recruit them if they are AUB graduates. So uh, I know that this is probably could not be equal employment opportunity, but I'm going to say it. I'm not sure if this is still the practice. Do you think that uh, targeting large organizations and making some sort of an arrangements with them for AUB, I'm saying, um, to um, uh, probably um, make sure that we have some sort of a quota or probably train our, um, probably provide an additional um, type of training, workshops, uh, et cetera, um, to our graduates so they would be more attractive to these large organizations and we could probably draft some sort of an arrangement with them so we make sure that our graduates have priority, continue to have priority. What do you think about that? I'd like to see quotas for women in the Lebanese par parliament in the next elections. That's what I'd like. I'd like to see a quota in the ministerial <laughs> cabinet. 
but I wouldn't like to see a quota with the engineering school because I'd like to take more than my quota. I, uh, we hire engineers, even they go into consulting and, and many other businesses. But uh, aside from my joke, uh, without them knowing, we already collaborate a lot with business schools and with AUB and others uh, because we have a stake. We would like to attract the best talent around, absolutely. And if it needs to be more formal, we're all, I, I can speak for Deloitte, of course, only. I'm very open for that because we look, we pay bilingual talent, those who speak Arabic, in the Arab word in Deloitte. Give them an allowance as part of their package. What does this tell you? It tells you we have a shortage of bilingual talent, unfortunately. So we are adding to their salary an allowance, which is called the bilingual allowance. Uh, we are working with on nationalization programs, Saudization, Emiratization, Qatarization, uh, uh, Oman, and all of that, because we'd like more talent from the region to work in our organization. We consider uh, ourselves not uh, only a global network, but also very much part of the region. We've been here since 1926. So absolutely, I'm very interested in arrangements with top universities. And if they need to be formal, so be it. If not, we're already recruiting their people. Uh, thank you. I mean, we have an interesting question in the Q&A, maybe that I will direct to Dean Shahadi. The question from Amin Germani is, how can higher education institutions support or prepare students to achieve the job priorities or characteristics that were identified in the finding? Uh, and I think uh, Lina will guide us later on in the roundtable discussion uh, with the employers and uh, Members of higher uh, education institutions, but uh, maybe very short insights on the question. You have to unmute them. Okay, thank <laughs> you for uh, unmuting me, but uh, it's not a bad experience. Uh, the, um, the the short answer is that we do that all the time. I mean, in fact, it goes back to the previous question. Part of the reason that we engage industry. Uh, closely is to understand the changing needs and ensuring that our curricula are up to date and uh, are evolving with what's happening in the world. Um, a lot of times our faculty are very much involved in high end research that has a much longer time frame and may be coming to fruition in 50 years from now, not not next year. And so they may lose sight of what's happening uh, in the short term in industry and making sure that what we're teaching is relevant. But going back to the larger question, Eileen, um, yeah, we do that. I mean, we, we ensure that our programs are, you, you know, the, 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 what they call soft skills in engineering, they call them soft skills. I call them human fundamental being a, a human being skill. Um, those are, are central to everything we're doing. We, we are making sure that, you know, in fact, we, we, we do surveys with our own graduates five years and 10 years out. Uh, to ask them, what was the most important thing you studied at AUB as an engineer? Um, you know, the number one course uh, that they all come back, or they don't all, but I mean, the number one course in that survey among those five and 10 years out, it's not math, it's not physics, it's not chemistry. So those are courses they all took. They all took those courses. The course they say was the single most important, more important than even coding was English, learning how to write, be articulate, how to speak in front of people. I mean, so fundamentally, that's AUB secret sauce. It's not that we teach them how to use a, a certain software tool and the, they can hit the, you know, they can hit work running from the first day. It's, it's to make sure that they know how to learn and that they're flexible and mature emotionally. Those are the, the types of things. And we can do that more by, um, less by classroom teaching and much more by hands-on real world uh, engagement. I hope that answered your question. I'd like to add to that, if you will allow me, uh, I also oversee the, the uh, learning and development in my organization. We have something called Deloitte University, across, uh, Deloitte University across the world. We're building a, a big center near Paris now, uh, and uh, the top priority is leadership skills for us. Top priority because you develop it over time, even as a young person. Uh, other, other, uh, you, these are things that need to develop. You can't teach them easily. 
These are the things we expect from universities. We take the content for granted, the engineering content, the technology, the math. This, this we take for granted. The differentiators for me to hire somebody, character, attitude, and these evidence for these types of skills. Evidence even if they played football, for God's sake, or were captain of a team. When we see that evidence, it means they will succeed. Because gaps we can address, we have curricula, we have things. But the other stuff is potential for something and that comes sometimes with the package we well, thank you uh, this is a fascinating discussion i'm very uh, sad to have to cut it short but we need to stay on schedule but hopefully we will have the chance to discuss further in the roundtable discussion later on uh, so now we move to our last presentation before the roundtable discussion, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Laurent Dupasquier and uh, Sandrine Belloc. Uh, they are both the co-founders and associate directors of Emerging. And Emerging uh, created the Global Employability University Ranking and Survey, the GERS, like 10 years ago. And it's uh, doing great, and it's published in the Times Higher Education, and uh, they will present to us the results of the 2021 uh, index, uh, with it specifically focused on the MENA region. Um, so I'm going to give the floor to Laura. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will be actually asking uh, Maria, one of my uh, colleagues, to help me with the sharing of, uh, of, of, the, of the slides. Uh, as I said, my name is Laurent Dupasquet. I'm the managing partner of, uh, of uh, Emerging, and uh, we publish every year since uh, 2010 now the Global Employability University Ranking and Survey. I will basically uh, tell you, give, give you a few uh, indications about what it is. Uh, some of the uh, key findings and key results of the uh, the last edition, which was published on the 24th of November in the Times Higher, and then I will lead. I will let my partner Sandrine Belloc uh, go much more in, in depth in details about the uh, uh, exclusive and non-published results actually regarding the the MENA region. Uh, but before um, before I actually before I, I I start explaining what the JERS is, what the methodology, what you can do with it. I'd just like, like to go back to why actually was it created, and it also kind of harks back to the conversation I've, I've just listened. Uh, this was in, I think, 2009, and uh, we were a consultancy, we still are a consultancy outfit, which was basically our, our target was large corporate companies, and we helped them to uh, identify and set up partnerships, and we also implemented some of the uh, corporations that were implemented within these partnerships. What happened is we realized, of course, that uh, there was a globalization of talent acquisition, and it's very clear what we're hearing today. Uh, but a lot of our companies, a lot of our clients, had a certain knowledge, usually do, did, did know roughly the, uh, the higher education uh, uh, sector in, in their country, local, sometimes regionally, sometimes nationally, very, very seldom on a, on a global level. And what they did, I mean, the way they function is that most of them, and they still do, have a list. They have lists, usually they're ranked by three tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. They have lists of universities or schools that they prioritize for partnerships, for recruitment, for R&D. And, uh, and we thought, okay, well, let's see. We actually need, and we need for our customers, we need to know what are the lists they can use on a, not only regional, local level, but national, but also regional and also globally, what would be the best universities for them to, for them to recruit in. Um, and also another, of course, another question we had was also, what are the practices? What are the cooperations between, between uh, universities and, 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 and uh, corporates? How do they function? What works, right? What, uh, what are the, the, the type of corporations that actually really foster employability? And we've touched on some of them before me. Uh, so we started looking around for the information and we couldn't find it. Actually, in 2009, there was no, nothing that could help you measure, even regionally at the European level, for instance, or globally, that would help you measure the employability, how, you know, the employability of the higher education. And basically, there was no survey that was also collecting the point of view of the of employers. 
right, on a global level. So we decided, well, if you know, no one is doing it, we'll have to do it ourselves. And this is how we started the, uh, the global employability. Um, Maria, maybe we can move on to the first. Uh, uh, Maria, thank you. Uh, and so the thing is, well, how did we go about it? Basically, the, it's, uh, the, the survey is basically really the point of view of the market. We call it the ranking, but it's actually not a ranking in per se. In that it just gives a specific angle, which are what are the universities which are preferred by employers. In that sense, it complements other rankings, more academically based, that already existed in the, in the, uh, when we started, and which is why, for instance, we have had a, a very fruitful and uh, long cooperation with the Times Higher, because our, they consider that our work you know, complements them. Uh, since then, I mean, we started 10 years ago, since then, some of the uh, uh, ranking providers in the last two or three or four years have uh, imitated the uh, Art de Marche, you know, they say copy is the ultimate form of flattery. So in that sense, uh, we have spawned other, at least two or three other employability uh, rankings, but this is by far the longest running, right? How does it work? It's very simple. You know, we, we basically, uh, we uh, identify, we create 22, 23 country panels, start with top employers and recruiters. I will go into the profile of these uh, recruiters afterwards. And uh, we, we administer a survey, which is always around a topic, right? The topic, which is basically, we're looking for the point of view of the corporate market on this specific topic. For instance, our first survey in 2010 was uh, based on the ideal young graduate. We were asking basically, uh, uh, the corporate world to describe what would be the ideal ground ground graduate. Uh, two years ago, we uh, we uh, we had uh, we had a survey basically about the the impact of of, of, uh, of the, the, the the whole uh, the notion of digital transformation and how and how and the importance of digital training in in terms of higher education. Uh, the last survey, what was released just now on the twenty second of November, centered around internationalization post COVID. How much, how much, uh, how much COVID has affected internationalization of higher education? How much is the problem? What kind? Of, what is internationalization? What is the value of internationalization? For instance, a uh, very interesting answer from uh, from our from our uh, participants is that they don't. I mean, for them, it's not absolutely essential that the young graduates have had a shared curriculum that has gone from one university to another university in another country and so on, the type of programs that universities are usually very proud to put forward. They don't see that as essential, but they see internationalization, yes, having a, a work experience abroad as something which is essential. And what they see, they, for them, the main advantage of internationalization is in how much it's linked to uh, soft skills, basically, employability skills, and some of them have uh, have been mentioned, but for instance, the capacity to adapt, right? The capacity to work, the collective work, which is, you know, which they always rate as the highest skills they're looking for, along with leadership. Um, so basically, we ask them the questions, and within those questions that we ask, some of them we repeat every year, some of them are new. Within those questions, we ask them to vote on the local list, that is a country list from their country of universities, and to select the ones that they consider the best, you know, most performing in terms of employability skills, right? And for those who recruit at, at um, recruit or manage at international level, right? We have uh, either because they recruit international profiles, either they, because they recruit at international level, either because they manage, for instance, project international project management, they manage multicultural teams. We ask them to vote. On a global list, right? Uh, it's basically uh, about 2,000 in, in, international institutions, and it's it's basically exactly it's a polling system, right? It really votes, and the, the ones that gets the, the highest number of votes is basically the winner. So every year we have a new ranking based on the votes of the uh, of the of the corporate market. Uh, we do this through the, and that's also I stress this because I think it's important in terms of the, the question of neutrality, is we have, the, we have this poll is carried out, we produce it, but it's carried out by a German polling institute called Trendens, right? And as I mentioned, it is published every year in the Times Higher Education. It's as a feature, as an editorial feature, but it's also part of their student website on a permanent basis. Um, basically, 
It provides unique data insight to tackle the, ta the challenges of future, future training, right? And, and it basically, and that's very important, I'm going to mention that, it, it gives a picture of the decisive factors, what we call the drivers, behind the recruiter's choice of best universities for employability. So what we started is something that we did for our, our clients, which is basically to help them to identify what were the, you know, the best institution. A lot of that information has become incredibly relevant to uh, universities. They contacted us a lot, which is why now we provide a lot of the data. Also, we provide the, the, and the learnings to university because to influence uh, how they, they plan for the future. Basically, uh, what we do is the ranking and survey, in terms of the data we collect, it can be broken down into various groups of participants, to which we can have comparisons by country, by sector, by role, by company size. Uh, we can also add another layer and analyze the answers by insights, employability, drivers, skills, gap satisfaction, gaps, or for instance, recommended type of corporations, which is... Um, um, so basically, what is uh, the sample? The cactus, when we started the first year, we were just going for, you know, HR and recruitment. And we found that actually this was not giving, we, it was very interesting to have the feedback directly from the market and from the operational, the operators there. So now we have a sample which is basically uh, based on operational managers which have more than five years experience. And they, uh, they basically, all of them recruit at more than five or manage and supervise more than five graduates a year. But it can be, of course, far more than that, right? I mean, 62%, uh, if I, yes, uh, recruit more than 10 graduates annually. Maria, yes. Uh, we, are, we, are, we have a balance, but we are, of course, very much interested in the very large employers to give their opinion in the market, which is why 65% work in companies with more than 500 employees. Right? Uh, for, I mean, it's a division half-half between those who have corporate business roles and then those that have IT roles and engineering roles, we also have, thank you, Maria. All right, and so in terms of sectors, I mean, we basically, we cover all the sectors. What's interesting though, in terms of the type of departments that this, as you can see this, of course, general management goes, it's 12%, but IT is just behind. So we have a, we have a strong IT flavor type, uh, in, term, in, in, in the, in, in, in the, the type of uh, our participants. Merci, Maria. Right, but what is very interesting, of course, is that we've, been, we've done that for many years, but then people said, yes, but you know, you're asking people to vote. Okay, we understand it's contextualized within the survey and questions, but nevertheless, how do we not know that this is just another ranking based on reputation, right? And which is fair enough, it's, it's, it's a very good question. And probably in the first years, it, I think it was quite relevant, and the way that the, the, uh, the ranking has evolved shows that perhaps it's far less relevant now. But one of the reasons what we've introduced, and that's, I think, quite innovative, I don't think anyone has been doing that, we decided to introduce the, uh, what are basically to analyze what were the drivers of performance. That is, we, we, we basically, we, we wanted to see what was behind the votes, right? Uh, we, we developed the concept with employers, based on what they've been telling us for the past 10 years, we identify six main drivers of graduate employability, right, uh, that matter to employers. Measuring ex ex expectation of employers on the one side, and then how they perceive the performance of universities in those aspects on the other, right? So this way we can actually explain the university ranking position, right? And we can even see, we can give that information to universities, how they can improve their position by analysis of the drivers behind the votes of these, uh, of these participants. Uh, so basically, uh, it really helps us to measure and analyze the performance of these, of these universities. Uh, I will go on to, so the, the key drivers of employability that we identified so far were academic performance, specialization, graduate skills, focus on work expertise, digital performance, and internationality. If you look at what we have, Ryan, and, and the people who vote, next slide, please, Maria. If you look at, Maria, can, yeah, thank you. If you look at the, if you look at what, what, and that's the information that's provided to people who vote, what do we mean by each of these drivers? Well, if I take, for instance, uh, uh, internationality, it, yes, there's international reputation, 
It is also international curriculum and staff and location. If I'm looking at focus on work expertise, the entrepreneurial environment, if there are a presence of you know, valuable work integrated programs in the curriculum, and particularly the type of corporate market shifts that develop. Right? So basically, what we have at the end, we have a ranking, but we also have a very, very refined uh, and very subtle and complex data about every from the votes. And so we can analyze by drivers, by location, we can, we can really act, give a really analysis, practically vote by vote of, of, uh, of the ranking. Now, yeah. Yes. So basically, as an example, right? Because the driver's rank is it's based basically on the number of votes which are obtained by university in each driver. In right, so we can actually we can also have uh, rankings by driver. We can have a ranking which are what are the universities that are the most selected for their digital, for instance, uh, uh, performance. Right, and so we will have a, a, a specialized ranking which will be slightly different from the global one. Right? Another example here is that. If I look at uh, that, I can analyze, for instance, the top 20 universities. What are the drivers? The main driver is graduate skills. Second is specialization. The third is focus on uh, work expertise. Now, if I look at the uh, top, uh, the, the universities are ranked between 20 and 200. I will see that the drivers tend to be slightly different, right? Basically, very simply, what we tend to see is that uh, for the top 20 the, uh, they're very much driven. I mean, the, the academic performance is, is, is still very much prevalent, far less for the others, where it's very much employability skills and particularly, and particularly digital performance, which is really, really rising in our ranking as a, as a, as a really significant uh, driver for, for, uh, for employability, but also graduate skills. <coughs> Maria, la prochaine. Right, so I'm just going to go quickly over some of the results, global results for 2001, uh, for the last edition. Thank you, Maria, the next slide. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then, I, but much more, I'll let my, my, my partner speak about the results in MENA. For this edition, <coughs> I mean, originally we started 3,000 managers, but this was in 2010. <coughs> this year we had nearly 11,000 respondents corresponding to the profile that I, I, I demonstrated earlier from 22 countries. So we had a, a total of votes, uh, 118,000 uh, votes, which basically focusing on the list of about 2,000 uh, institutions worldwide. So uh, what we have every year, we have country panels, we have about this, we have a core of about 15 country panels that we use every year. And then each year we select different countries for panel, right? Uh, so we've had in the region, we've had Morocco, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, uh, Qatar, uh, uh, Lebanon as, as, uh, as country panels. Uh, in this edition from the region, we only had the United Arab Emirates. Uh, but roughly, the people who responded made up can correspond to about 300,000 recruitments of young graduates for, for that year, the year before. Right. Merci. Uh, just quickly, this is this is the top 20. I mean, you can access all of these results either on the Times Higher website, either on our website. But basically, if you look at the top 20, well, in the top 10 is, I would say, we tend to find the usual suspects, and they've been they've been roughly the same since the beginning, and it's very much US and up to a certain degree UK dominated. But uh, I would like you to note, nevertheless, and we'll go much, uh, we'll look at other results, but. One surprising one is National University of Singapore. It was when we started in 2010, I don't think it was even in the top 100, and it, every year it's, it's rising and rising and rising. And it also corresponds and also goes back to the conversation I, we had earlier at this conference, the fact that they've put a very strong emphasis on soft skills, and for instance, and, and the leadership, uh, cooperation, collective intelligence, and they've put a very strong focus, and I think this probably expect, explains Amongst other things, uh, there the fact that they've risen so well in our in our ranking. Um, otherwise, what we can see is from ten to twenty, there's a larger variety. It's not only US and UK, and you basically have universities from everywhere. Um, the uh, basically in the last ranking, uh, two hundred and fifty universities rank. They're from forty four countries. I'd like to point out that when we started, there was twenty nine different countries. So. We are definitely seeing a broadening uh, and a, an increasing globalization of higher education, right? 
And for the first time, and this is what I was referring to, the recruiters are placing digital and soft skills and subject specialization uh, above academic excellence. And this is the first year this has happened. And I think this this we'll, we'll see in the conversation, the roundtable. I think this is this is a, and as us as a company, a lot of the uh, the, 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 the the corporations we implement between uh, between higher education institutions and companies are to do with soft skills, right? And cooperation between higher education institutions and corporate world to develop the soft skills of the young graduates. We think that this will become one of the leading uh, uh, field of cooperation between between both worlds in the future. Uh, so interest no uh, yes thank you yes interesting enough this is this is an uh, this is basically what we've done is we've looked at the share of votes for universities in the global ranking right so not the number of institutions that they have in the top 150 but how many votes institutions from that specific country gathered collectively now obviously the USA is very very far above uh, the rest with about 25 percent but uh, 10 years ago, this was nearly 50%. So you have to look at it. There's two ways of looking at it. But yes, the globalization means more competition for, for US, definitely. A very interesting fact. I mean, you know, and we've, we've run into some flack with the French press actually because of that, because of the high position of France. You know, they start questioning the validity of our ranking because of that. But let me remember that first, it's carried out by a German polling institute. And secondly, only 4% of the respondents were French. So it's, uh, we were very surprised when this started appearing a few years ago, but it's confirmed every year. And I think we have a few explanations for that. France and UK are basically on equal foot. The, the number of votes uh, that separates them is like 20 votes. So it's very similar. Germany, which has the second number of institutions placed in the 250, but out there, because they are less well-placed, only rises into four. The most significant thing, and of course, there's nothing new and will be of come of no surprise to anyone else, has been the rise of China. We were one of the first rankings where there was a very important uh, representation of Chinese institutions. Uh, that kind of, it kind of stalled in the three years, and it's, since COVID, it's been going up again, and it jumped two places to number five. And of course, but I'll go back to that, a very, very strong performance from the Netherlands. Next slide, please, Maria. Uh, so I'm just going to go very, I'm, we're not going to go into details, obviously, but this is U.S. and Canada. I mean, obviously, U.S., you have, you have 54 that uh, universities present in the top 250. Uh, but uh, they were, the number was practically double when we started in 2010. Uh, there's not many, uh, and actually, you should know the strong performance of Canadian universities, because if you look at relative to the size of the population, number of institutions, number of higher education students. If you look at the ratio, and we have instruments that measure that, uh, the Canadian performance is actually, in terms of employability, it's probably higher than that of the US uh, institutions in our ranking. Uh, in the case of Europe, and this is, oh, first Latin America. Well, Latin America has still a very small presence. It's rising, I mean, it's mostly uh, fueled by Mexico. We've seen two Argentinian institutions appearing in the two years. But let's say that's still an area of the world, and, and even more so Africa, of course, but they, not but Southern Africa, but, the, but it's there, there where there's still scope for development. Um, in Europe, in Europe, so we have two things very interesting. In the case of the UK, what we have is you have the usual list of suspects. I mean, if I look at the list of universities there, it's basically the Russell Group, which groups the top uh, English universities. In France, and this explains probably why France is doing so well in this ranking, whereas it's not doing so well in other research-based rankings, right, is that uh, because of the Grand École system, which is very, very specific to France, and basically, which are schools which were created specifically for employability reasons, because the corporate world found that the French university system was not preparing well enough their young graduates for the workplace, so they basically... I mean, these schools were created mostly by the corporate sector, and, and they basically have employability as the idea. They've always been about that, far more than research. So if you look at the French list, you'll see that most of them, practically all of them, are uh, dans l'école and not, you know, not public universities. Although it's a new trend in the last two, three, four years, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing state universities rise into the 
into the, the ranking. Uh, next slide, Maria. And uh, if I look now at uh, there, I would just like to note, so Germany has the second highest number of institutions present with 250. And, you know, it has risen. They, they only had six when we started in 2010. But now there's a recognition very much. I mean, there's a, as we know, there are some very strong links between the corporate sector, employers, and universities and the whole education system in Germany, which is also far more vocational than other systems. And this is the results. And then, of course, a very, very strong performance of the Netherlands. I mean, in relation to number of universities and population, it's, uh, we calculated it's probably the country which has the highest performance indicator with Switzerland. Uh, moving on to other parts of the world, uh, obviously Scandinavians do well uh, in relation to their population, which will come as no surprise. And otherwise, we are still noting the really weak participation of uh, Eastern European universities and Russian. Uh, this is actually mirrored in most rankings. Uh, we haven't seen a, a takeoff of the higher education sector in that area comparable to the economic takeoff. That might be a question mark for the future. Finally, uh, I will move on to Asia Pacific. Now, that's the area which has the most developed in our ranking in the last 10 years. I mentioned China, of course, and a new phenomenon, which is India. We have been waiting and predicting that India will rise, but it wasn't there. And it's only in the last two or three years. And it's very, very much linked, very obviously so, to the importance of digital skills and digital transformation as, an, as, as a driver for employability. And to finish, yes, and uh, Australia, I mean, like Canada, they were the, the two competitors to the US, you know, as, as global competitors to attract and acquire uh, uh, English students. They've been a bit led down. I mean, their performance is not as good this year, but I think that's very much linked to COVID, right? But otherwise a very strong performance. And now I would just like to finish with, next slide please, Maria. Yes, but just a few figures. This ranking, it was originally designed for employers. In that respect, that's probably why it has a recognition. It has among employers because we are the second most consulted ranking by employers. This is from an independent study, uh, which we carry out every two years. Uh, we have this last edition. We have had already more than seven. We have had more than 700, uh, 700 um, uh, 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 articles of press, and uh, we have very, we're very active on social media, and so with one billion potential reach uh, for the campaign. Uh, so we are obviously getting much more exposure depending on the areas, right? Uh, but very, very strong, uh, very strong in uh, in Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. I will just now let my 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 Sandrine, my my colleague, uh, uh, continue to give you more specific insights on the results for uh, the MENA region. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, I have to lose. Okay, so we're not doing great in terms of time, uh, oh. but it's a uh, yeah, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Let's move, let's, let's, let's try more quickly then, sorry. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to try to, to make it uh, a bit faster to, to cope with the schedule, Fida. Um, uh, I'm going to then again give you the insights on the MENA region. Of course, the MENA region covers different realities and different uh, countries. Uh, but we've tried to compile the findings, the common findings, as far as employability uh, of young graduates is concerned. Okay, so um, why does it uh, why doesn't it work? Let me see. Oh, so. ah, okay. So first of all, the let's see the ranking findings. So we have seven. Um, universities of the region in the in the ranking right now. We saw the first one coming in in 2016. They remained in the ranking. They were in the position. They were they arrived at the same time and at the same position. They were the American University in Dubai and the King Abdulaziz University of Saudi Arabia. Um, they arrived in the same position and 
in that in that rank, we used to say at Emerging that this is our laboratory. Um, the specific methodology that we, that we use allow us to think uh, that whenever um, you, whenever something happens somewhere in the world, as far as the job market is concerned, we immediately see it in the ranking. Uh, we have a direct answer and direct translation from the field through the uh, employers in, in the ranking. So those two universities enter and we think they set the pace to the full pack that arrived almost at the same time between 2018 and 2019 with uh, the King Saud University, the Abu Dhabi University, the American University of Beirut, the Qatar University and the Université Internationale de Rabat. So their place uh, is very stable. Um, some a few drop and some uh, are quite stable. The most fragile one is uh, the Université Internationale de Rabat, uh, but uh, all the other ones are really not moving since a few years, since two or three years. Um, they now have to make a step forward and and prepare themselves to to grow in the ranking. We think that there are lots of similarities in this um, uh, evolution in what we saw for China, for example, 10 years ago. We saw a few universities coming in, they stabilized for a few years, and then they started climb climbing. So uh, we hope that will be the same process for uh, MENA region universities. We did this slide too, because it's, it's, this um, analysis was very specific we compared, we, we, know, we added all the votes for all the universities uh, that were ranked uh, from the MENA region in our ranking. And uh, we saw that regional votes were very important, um, which is very different from other regions of the world. We can find that picture, let's say, in other regions like Asia, but not in that proportion. What does it mean? It means for us, at least, that the um, that the, the, the market, the job market, is is really in high demand. First of all, and that the employers of the region have started now, since they are international recruiters, they can recruit anywhere they want, but they've started now to consider the universities of the region as uh, good partners and ma mature partners to at least recruit part of uh, what they need as far as graduates are concerned. So, of course, they recruit, but there are lots uh, to, that remains to be done. And we see that the average level of satisfaction uh, is not that great. Uh, we, of course, countries are different. We see that in the Emirates, uh, the Emirates join the, the worldwide club of being quite satisfied, quite satisfied, let's say, with the system. Um, Morocco is the less satisfied of all countries in, in, in the region. So we've been asking them, the uh, recruiters, uh, what were the challenges that they were facing uh, in the future of work, or, and, and not only in the future of work, is that uh, really what we saw in the, in the slide of the origin of votes is that the need was immediate. There was a very short term need of lo lots of recruitments. Um, we saw that uh, the figure of permanent transformation is what they consider as being their main challenge. Uh, it's the bigger challenge than anywhere uh, than anywhere else in the world. So the permanent transformation means, means for them an increase of specialization in knowledge, which means what hard skills and also soft skills and to enter into innovation, uh, innovation, sorry, ecosystems. So that would be the, the main challenges they would consider, uh, and that would the, the the university and the higher education system will have to face or will have to to cope with um, in the next in the next years. So we we've analyzed, as Laurent mentioned, the driver of employability performance of the universities of the region to see if they were really. Um, in line with what the, the recruiters were expecting for their challenges. And we see that uh, although specialization and focus on work expertise uh, is well addressed, or at least correctly addressed, 
um, graduate skills remain uh, on the it, it remain to be improved. Let's say uh, while it's number one in the in the rest of the uh, in the rest of the world in, for the, for the other universities in in the ranking. So we have uh, we have a good news for our host, the American University of Beirut. Uh, because since we have uh, this uh, driver system, we are capable to do uh, tables by drivers, like the best of class driver by driver. And actually, the AUB um, is one of the best universities in the is the first university in the region for internationality, and one of the best in the world with this driver marking its performance very very much. Um, the digital performance is also very good for the for the AUB. So, uh, what what could be the focus of the universities if we consider what the, the employers have to say? Well, in the rest of the world, you know, uh, for global respondents, uh, universities uh, to to provide them with the ready to work graduate and very fast. Um, should focus on practice and case studies. Um, we already told about, talked about that in, in the previous presenta presentations. Uh, that's obviously one of the levels to, uh, to provide the, the graduates with the soft skills that are so much demanded right now. But for the region, number one is the relationship with the corporate world. Normally, we could think that uh, practice and case studies goes with the relationship with the corporate world, but it doesn't seem to be that case. Uh, that's something that remains to be analyzed in, in, in the region. So what do they ask? They ask relationship with the corporate world, flexibility of students in choosing their learning path, which is the second um, main focus for the universities the, uh, upon the, the, the answers of the uh, recruiters. And the third point is the international and intercultural perspective. So we've been focusing and zooming on this point, international perspective, as it was the topic of the, the survey this year. And we took the example uh, of the uh, United Arab Emirates as the, the, the sample was showing figures that were very interesting and quite representative of the rest of the of the region. So we saw that the, in the, the Emirates, the, the international uh, the international experience uh, was considered as much more important than in the rest of the world, and even that so important that fifty two percent of the recruiters were um, giving a grade of between seven and ten to this uh, to this uh, item, uh, showing that they they really count on that maybe to improve the skills of uh, of their graduates. Uh, we want we asked them which type of international experience they would consider uh, useful to improve the, the employability of a graduate. And uh, of course, they start the, the, the professional study experience in a foreign country was number one. Uh, but we see that the multi campus degree for one university grant could be a model that universities should follow in the region that would, could be very well accepted, as this could uh, allow the, the students, of course, to to travel and and, and meet different realities over the over the world. One very important point of this uh, slide is to show that the online degree from a foreign university could be considered in the region as a way to internationalize its training, proving that uh, the, the, the digitalization of the education is very, very well accepted and very well managed uh, in, in the region, apparently. So, um, what, what, what could uh, the international experience provide to the graduates? Well, soft skills. Soft skills, that was the answer uh, of the, the whole sample all over the world. Uh, confidence, curiosity, problem solving, critical thinking, all come from interna international experience, not only, of course, 
lots of other things can be done in the universities. But this shows just that this is what is really requested from the graduates in the region, at least. And then as a, as a wrap up uh, for this, uh, for this presentation, uh, we've been um, uh, selecting, let's say, the, the main uh, themes that were uh, present in the, in the survey. And, and we see what we see that online education can replace face to face training program. That's a statement that was voted for, which was, I was saying before the um, uh, employers. Uh, consider that yes, an online education can replace um, uh, uh, the, the, the traditional education, not for everything, of course, but they're ready to, to study that point. Um, that they now trust the regional institutions to provide them with the right profile. They are very demanding to this, uh, to, the, to, the, to the, the local institutions, but they trust they will make it. Uh, that, of course, nowadays it is difficult to assess the quality of a university because lots of things is, uh, is moving and, and changing and precisely the future of work makes, uh, makes the challenges very high for the, for the universities. So, since the challenges are very high, the university should mainly prepare students to start into the present labour market, which is the main challenge right now. And they have to adapt their business, their business models. So I just come back to one of the slides that, uh, that I will finish with, uh, which is the type of cooperation between companies and universities, because what we observe through our survey is that employers are really willing uh, to participate. Uh, they are very much interested. Uh, every year we have more and more participants to the survey and they, they understood actually that their role would be fundamental uh, in helping out uh, the higher education system in, in going towards uh, uh, more employability of the graduates. So um, what they consider of could be their participation within the system would be in business soft skills teaching. And I think that would, uh, that would be also one of the topic of the, of the round table, uh, business soft skill teaching. It's actually what they can do, but what they need to. So, um, the, 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 the panels we had for, for a few years were Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Morocco, as, uh, uh Laurent mentioned, and of course. Following, I mean, we can extract analysis for each uh, each of those each of those countries. So I've tried to speed up a bit my presentation. I hope it was clear, and uh, I'm ready to hear the questions. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, can you please unshare your slides so that we can see each other? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing that. I'm. Oh, you see. Hello. Okay. Sorry, Fida. No problem at all. I knew I was. A, I'm not a digital <laughs> native. Okay. <laughs> um. So, any any questions for for Laura and Sandrine? Um, uh, we are running a bit uh, behind schedule, uh, but the, um, so we are going to take only five minutes break. If you want to stretch your legs, get some coffee, water, and we will resume at uh, four thirty sharp with the roundtable uh, discussion. So stay tuned.
Thank you everyone for staying on with us. Uh, it has been really very interesting discussion so far and uh, it's only going to get better as we move forward. Uh, so I'm very happy to introduce uh, the moderator of the uh, roundtable discussion, Dr. Lina Dao Ori. Uh, Lina is our colleague at uh, the Alliance School of Business. She, she's a tenured associate professor uh, of uh, work and organizational psychology. Uh, she has expertise in so many things, human resource management, uh, organizational behavior. She's also uh, in 2020, she has been awarded the Distinguished um, Scholar Award from the Arab Fund for Social and Economic Development. And Lina is also a founder of, uh, co-founder of Khadid Beirut. So I'm very happy to have Lina uh, moderating the roundtable discussion. Lina, I'm gonna pass it on to you to lead us on and introduce the panelists. Uh, let me un unmute you, I'm gonna unmute the camera. Thank you, Fida, for the introduction. Um, perhaps I would like to also add one small thing is that um, this conversation earlier this afternoon was like music to my ears. The focus on um, interpersonal, interpersonal skills has uh, is not, you know, uh, um, is also part and parcel of what we do at the business school. Um, the fact that we have three organizational psychologists who actually developed uh, a lot of the curricula focused on developing those skills makes us very, very proud. And I am very eager now to continue this conversation now with uh, uh, this uh, incredible selection of speakers and panelists that we have today. So our session is interactive. I'm going to start by telling you briefly who is with me today in this uh, roundtable discussion. And then we will start um, uh, tell you a little bit more about what we aim to discuss. So, um, we'll now share my content. content. Okay. Okay. So, um, first we have with us Dr. Rada Barsoum, who is a tenured uh, associate professor and chair of the public policy and administration department at AUC, American University of Cairo. She is an expert in employment and social policies. We have Mr. Cesar Wazen who's the Director of International Affairs uh, Office at Qatar University. Um, and his interests are in uh, uh, rankings, academic accreditation, student assessment, uh, and he brings uh, a lot of experience in the field of employability as well. We have also with us Mr. Lino Kataruzzi, uh, who is the Managing Director of Google in the MENA region. Um, and Mr. Kataruzzi is driving Google MENA's regional development and helping grow wider digital ecosystem through scalable, scalable programs, which we will hear a little bit more about uh, in our roundtable. We also have Mr. Khudr Badrian, who is the Chief HR Officer at Azadea, um, and he brings with him uh, strong expertise in talent management, succession planning, and compensation management. We also have Mr. Hamza Debar. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right because the H, I wondered how it is pronounced. So Hamza, you should correct me uh, uh, when you can. So he's the founder of 3W Academy, which uh, um, Adil Shadi referred to earlier in the conversation. And he has a strong experience uh, business and education uh, in the business and education leadership uh, and in designing and delivering custom made and scalable and uh, upskilling and reskilling curricula. Uh, last but not least, we also have Ms. Khulut Fawaz, who is a, a gender and a sexual and reproductive health specialist. Uh, she is an AUB graduate with a Master of Public Health, and her research interests are in um, displaced populations. And today she brings in as, you know, as a recent scholar, she also joins us from, you know, shedding from, you know, shedding from the student experience as well. The student experience as well. So I'm going to stop sharing. So I'm going to stop sharing my and thankfully, the echo disappeared <laughs> with it as well. Um, great. So, um, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for being with us here today. Um, so, as we heard from the discussions earlier, the world is really changing and uh, changing at an unprecedented uh, rate. What we thought is going to come in ten years actually came in one year, or even sometimes less. And what we are we have been talking about as uh, 
uh, um, Irena said earlier, as the future of work is actually the present of, of work. So we have lots of questions that also arise from this. Are universities preparing students well for the job market? Um, what are the skills of this future or this present that are required? And how can we um, collaborate more as higher education and employers in order to meet the needs of this ever-changing market? Uh, how can we be there for the students who are also the future of, uh, you know, this, this planet as a whole? Because we can no longer think about countries and regions only um, because of all, all this interconnectedness. So today's roundtable is really focused on that. We're going to be discussing um, the job skill mismatch, uh, and I'm putting miss uh, uh, in brackets because we also want to talk about where we are matching and we need to know what we are doing right and what are the skills that you are de developing in the right way, developing in the right way. way. what are the, uh, the, what are the, the, the skills that are required that we need to put more effort and energy in. So, as you saw, this panel uh, uh, that we have here uh, includes employers, academic and, and other key uh, uh, stakeholders who are concerned with skilling of uh, the youth in the MENA. And these conversations are extremely important for both for employers and for employers and in order to start in order to start changes between the job market and what the job market requires and everyone who is leaving our universities and going into the workplace. So um, a good start of our conversation could be to better understand how the market, job market in different parts of the MENA looks like and how it resembles or differs from other job markets, whether in the MENA or even outside globally. Um, and Mr. Uh, uh, Hamza uh, Debar, uh, who, um, you know, I just introduced him as coming with a very strong experience in uh, education and leadership. Um, he has led innovative educational uh, and training programs, and um, one of uh, uh, Hamza, one of your areas of expertise is employability, which led you to design reskilling and upskilling programs for youth in Morocco in particular, and perhaps beyond. So, perhaps from your perspective, if you can tell us, how would you describe the employment market in Morocco today, and what commonalities and differences may it, um, does it have with other countries in the MENA region? Uh, uh, and also other countries around the world. Irina, thank you very much. So, um, um, am I well heard? Is it is it working correctly? Yeah. Okay. Super. So, just between brackets, my name is the Bar. Uh, I'm not the the bar, bar. So okay. yeah, it's it's a rain. Yes, it's a rain. Uh, yeah. I should write it in Arabic. Definitely, you would write it G H <laughs> the R. So now in Morocco, I learned a new yeah, thing. R H is the R. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it works as well. So um, thank you very much. Uh, yes, actually, my my in my experience, um, I got in touch with the employability issue nationwide in Morocco um, um, through my entrepreneurial journey, but also through my activities as a board member for uh, international NGOs working in that field here. Um, what I would uh, first, I mean, I would start to, with, with this. Uh, to me, employability is really like not only an individual uh, capacity of someone, but also a characteristic of a global ecosystem. So I would say that um, I would tackle employability through that lens, which is a systemic thing, a systemic characteristic. Uh, and this is why also at, at the end of, of, of my, of my uh, talk, I would say that training is not the solution, uh, though I am a, a trainer. <laughs> so in Morocco, basically, we we have a, a national crisis of employability, that's for sure. Uh, so the, the best programs here only achieve 70% integration rate and the, the average integration rate is less than 50% of graduates. Uh, th this is on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, there is a race for talent in a lot of sectors, but we are still in very low volume in terms of recruitment, which means that there is a structural uh, an unemployment rate. The economy is not uh, uh, creating enough jobs for, for, for our youth. So basically every year we have 200,000 to 250,000 people graduating from uh, higher education or vocational training, uh, but only 50 to 70,000 jobs uh, that are created net uh, on the market. So that means that there is a structural gap. The other gap is a qualitative gap. So 
we have sectors that are booming, like the IT sector, which is the sector where uh, uh, we chose to start the, the boot camp in Morocco. And in the IT sector, we have, it's, it's, it's almost absurd, but we have a 50% rejection rate uh, because it's, a can, it's basically a candidate, like, like uh, Rana said before, it's, it's a candidate uh, a market. So basically, uh, in Morocco as a whole, we train a thousand engineers in IT, uh, so uh, every year, which is super low uh, uh, as, as, as a volume, and they each each one of them gets basically three to four uh, uh, job uh, <laughs> job propositions. So um, it's quite odd as a market, I would say, and this is why we. Uh, I mean, my, my solution was to bring this this boot camp, uh, so super intensive training, uh, upskilling and reskilling training to Morocco because. The solution for us was to say, okay, um, we need to uh, we need to to make sure that there are enough talent, there is an, uh, enough talent pool for the IT sector in Morocco, and also to create opportunities for a lot of talented young people who just happen to choose uh, when they chose to happen to choose a, a, a degree where there, there is a lack of opportunity uh, locally. Uh, at the end, uh, I would say also that COVID. Uh, created something really, really interesting here uh, because basically a lot of our young graduates are now working remotely for startups uh, in Europe or in the MENA region, uh, which emphasizes the lack of, of, of talented uh, candidates here locally. Uh, and also, it, it has been much easier to work with companies since then because they are feeling a lot more pressure. So. I know that before it was a matter of engaging employers to come to our school, our university to, to work with us on the program. Now they are asking us to build programs. So this is very interesting as well, I think, uh, in terms of trends on the market. Thank you, Hamza. I would also like to invite our other um, roundtable speakers, if you would like to add anything about your views on the, um, on the trends in the market. Um, but I actually wanted to ask you also one more thing, like in terms of the, um, you're saying that a lot of the people now or the, the youth in Morocco are getting jobs outside, uh, outside Morocco, outside the boundaries. And it's, you know, unfortunately, it took us a pandemic to kind of realize that we can do these things and it's not actually so bad. We don't really have to see the employee with our own eyes, uh, you know, from uh, eight to five in order for them to be productive. And if you think also from the other perspective, let's say if we think about Europe that is currently suffering from um, an aging, you know, problems related to the aging population and they are benefiting or they need highly skilled immigrants to work and fill gaps over there. Is it, you know, healthy to continue to have the conversations about the job skill mismatch at the regional level? Or is it, you know, it, is it a global conversation that we need to be uh, moving to at the moment? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, Laurent said it earlier, and to me, employability is really something global now, especially in sectors or in uh, uh, jobs that are easily, uh, I mean, that are flexible, that are easily done remotely. Uh, so in the in the tech sector, for example, almost 80% of the jobs uh, can be remote, and we have fully remote companies now as well. Uh, so of course, uh, I mean, it's it's a huge global opportunity for our region because we have a lot of young people uh, who can be qualified for these jobs and who don't have opportunities locally. So yeah, individually speaking, it's a huge opportunity, I think, for our youth. And I think that as uh, higher ed actors, uh, that's something that we need to include in our programs and our, and our strategy. Thank you, Hamza, uh, very insightful. Uh, Fida, we have a poll question scheduled uh... Now, if we can run it, if you can get your opinions, uh, Fida is going to uh, put a poll question, but uh, we have also a comment from Cesar first. Cesar, please. Yes, thank you, Rina. I just wanted to, um, you know, second what uh, Hamza is saying. We have seen at the university level a big rush from the industry suddenly to learn more and to be more engaged in uh, this, um, you know, this effort of uh, preparing the students for the job market. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I agree with you or you know, the point that you have mentioned about the global issue, I think this pandemic has taught us or has humbled everybody 
I think it's a global matter now. Uh, you know, the um, it's nice to be uh, you know looking at rankings and seeing the best universities in the world. Of course, I'm happy that uh, we're number one, and my alma mater is now close number two and number one in some areas. So this is a privilege that uh, not many have. But uh, the main point is that uh, everybody was humbled. We've seen the debacle of uh, the big nations, what they call big nations in this pandemic. And I think that uh, everybody is resetting now. And uh, yeah, it is a global matter rather than a, just a, a regional matter. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Cesar. Uh, it's true that, you know, what is a great opportunity for us is also a great opportunity for other parts of the world. And it's important that we start collectively as humans, start seeing it in that manner. Um, because it will, you know, we can serve a lot of purposes if we start thinking to give us lots of advantages and help us serve and close lots of gap if we start thinking globally, where we're thinking at the global level, but at the same time thinking locally and trying to create synergies and, and matching between them. Fida, we are ready for your poll. Okay, just give me uh, three more seconds. I will give you three more seconds. And I welcome any other comments from uh, our panelists in the meantime, but you know, it's only uh, limited by seconds. <laughs> I actually had lots of questions also for the previous panels, but because of time, I kind of limited myself uh, from asking them. So perhaps if we get extra time a little bit at the end, we will go back and, and, and ask them as well. I oh, opened the call. The poll is open, so please, um, if you work in a higher education institution, how well do you think you are preparing your students for the jobs of the future? Fida, for those who are not in higher education, can they answer it as how well do they think higher education is preparing students yes. for future jobs? Yeah, that's <laughs> More inclusive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, progress. Yeah. So I'm gonna close the poll. This will give people incentives to uh, try to answer faster and show the results. It's close in seven seconds. You have one second. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we have a um, few participants who said well and more participants who said somehow well. This is quite interesting, but the more interesting part and, uh, you know, what we really want to dig deeper into is why and what are those skills and how, you know, and how can we do it differently? And that's going to be, you know, uh, uh, the rest of our con conversation. Um, Mr. Lino Cataruzzi, after serving as um, country di director for Google in Mexico, Argentina and Argentina, you joined Google uh, Mina in 2017 as managing director. Uh, as the, you know, the regional uh, managing director. And one of your aims was to drive, uh, you know, regional development uh, uh, in the um, in the MENA. And your efforts are not only focused on enabling local business partners boost growth online, but also on helping wider digital ecosystems through scalable programs and initiatives. So we'd definitely like to hear a little bit more about that. But you know, before, can you first tell us from your perspective, what are the skills that are needed in the job market in the MENA in particular and globally uh, and beyond as well? Um, what are those skills that you think uh, employers are critically looking at uh, uh, across industries? And also, if you can tell us about what kind of initiatives are you at Google uh, uh, involved in in order to tackle these issues and, and ensure that those um, skills are being developed among youth. Perfect. 
Um, good evening and good afternoon. Um, let me cover quickly what I think are the key skills today. I'll talk a little bit into what the trends are for the future, and then I close by to some of the things that we are doing as, as Google. So today I will start with, with the obvious, with digital skills. And obviously COVID uh, has increased the need for those skills uh, dramatically. Uh, from uh, I can give you day-to-day -day examples on, on people that from one day to the other, they couldn't come to the office anymore and they needed to learn a way of working completely new. Many of them didn't even have a computer home or their employer didn't have a computer to send them home. And even if you, if you forget about that, if you look at MENA as a region, every year we get millions of new people connected to internet. So you get all these waves of uh, new uh, joiners to the digital world. And it's, as you know, uh, um, journey in which people uh, start learning uh, little by little and we need to speed up that process. Uh, so first, digital literacy and digital skills. Second, adaptability. What we see today is that the reality that we have today is going to be disrupted on a regular basis. Regardless of the industry that you are in the field that you're in, disruption will come your way. You need to adapt and the quicker you adapt, the better you're going to deliver. Uh, that applies to individuals, to their skills, and to the organizations they work for, regardless of what they are. Then problem solving. Um, it's well known that uh, we recently in the UAE were shifting uh, the days and also the public sector is going to work four and a half days. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter if you clearly define what objectives your uh, people needs to deliver on the periods you're measuring them all. I think we're going to have a, an increased shift into uh, objectives and key results to be delivered in a given time frame. And uh, will be more flexibility into, OK, how much time each one of us spend to achieve those things. Then fourth, I'll, I'll mention teamwork, uh, because uh, you'll see with the increased digital skills, more and more people collaborating to achieve results. And finally, uh, I'm going to talk resilience. And that specifically under COVID was uh, incredibly tested. Quickly, let's talk a little bit about the future. Let's see uh, what are the skills uh, fast forward. Uh, so the first one, we're going to make it 2.0, digital skills 2.0. Which devices are we going to be using in 10, 15 years? Uh, just think on the devices you're, we are using 10, 15 years before. How we're going to be engaging. How maybe in a augmented reality or virtual reality, you will be engaging with your colleagues. And how you can keep this you know, um, proximity and the exchange with them. That's obviously something that's gonna be very valuable. Then AI is coming in most of the fields, but I'm not talking about AI, how you code the new AI platform or similar, not at all. I'm saying how you bring AI into your business, how you have the skills to at the top decide how this AI can uh, make your business more competitive or can how can you deliver more value to your employer. Uh, data skills, uh, managing data in an efficient way. Uh, I, I love the presentation before on the rankings. We are a company driven by data uh, and we make our decisions based on that. That's coming more and more and more into, into everywhere. And uh, finally, I'm going to go to creativity. There will be abundance of data, abundance of technological resources, different ways of engaging and collaborating. We will need to differentiate ourselves as companies, as businesses, as institutions, to be more competitive. Creativity is going to be super important for the future. And now I zoom in into some of the things we are doing uh, to try to bridge some of the gaps we identified today. So we launched an initiative that is called uh, Grow Stronger with Google, which basically aims into uh, uh, focusing to everyone, but women and youth in particular. And by the way, as a, as a quick note, uh, we were wondering if we were going to have uh, enough number of women graduating in the region. And actually, that was not the challenge. They were always graduating, and it was uh, re relatively easy to try to get them to join and uh, finish those programs. So what we're trying to do with this is, number one is employability. What are the basic skills that you can give to a person to be able to be employed much faster, much better, or make a jump in their career today. 
meaning that they get a better job. We do this through a program specifically called Maharad Min Google, which goes into digital skills, how you uh, can be uh, better online, uh, also how can you have more presence online if you own a business, or how can you do things uh, better and different. Also, uh, we started doing a number of uh, loans uh, and financial grants specifically for startups and, and businesses. We distributed $4 million. Uh, we increased visibility of 150,000 businesses. This is just for Saudi and UAE. So when somebody is looking for you online, that they can find you so you can sell uh, better. Uh, and also we gave $9 million in grants uh, to governments and businesses. Uh, particularly on ads, so they can communicate their, their, their products, their messages, uh, and other things. Uh, last thing is uh, Google for Startups. We launched already our third edition. We are um, nurturing a number of startups and try to uh, accelerate their development. The more startups that are successful and they graduate, the more the spillover into uh, technology, uh, skills, and uh, expertise is going to happen in the region. So very quickly, an overview on, into what we are doing and some of the skills we consider basic. Thank you. This is very insightful. And quite a few of the skills that you mentioned uh, are actually referred to inter and intrapersonal type of skills. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, uh, for example, regarding, let's say, teamwork. Um, we know the skills that are required for good teamwork in uh, uh, the old workplace and the old workplace, meaning the face to face where people are around the same table, etc. But do you think those skills are changing even for teamwork? For example, now that we are moving more to a hybrid model and uh, we're moving more to the digital world. And, and if so, do you have insights into how and, and what way they are changing? Yes, absolutely. They are changing. Uh, we don't have all the answers. Uh, let me be very humble as an organization in that regard and uh, myself as an opinion. So we, we try to analyze the data into uh, we've been an online company for long and interacting in global teams, regardless of where you were based. But we did this 5.0 of this because of the context and situation. And we saw changes in the behavior of the people uh, and some of the assumptions we had on the beginning before going into this journey were proven wrong. So particular, uh, which teams were suffering more from a well-being point of view, uh, sorry, which profiles, not teams, were suffering more. And then how teams needed to cope uh, to making sure they were checking with their team members in a different way. Over-communicating was another need uh, that was clear. Then the interpersonal um, skills of uh, individuals are different when you are face-to-face -face than when you are in a virtual world. And some of the tools take advantage of this. So we expect a more inclusive uh, ambience for working. And we expect uh, as well uh, that the tools will allow to uh, uh, employees to choose the profile in which they want to collaborate more efficiently as a team. Thank you, uh, uh, Nino. That was very helpful. And I think this is also something for us as researchers, other areas that we need to be focusing on moving forward is that how did those skills that we've been training on and trying to develop in our um, um, in, the, in the working population and also uh, the youth and students, how are they changing due and as a result of the uh, virtual world as well? And just um, a quick comment, uh, which to me is key, is uh, I don't think any organization has all the answers into the future. To me, uh, and I was yesterday participating in, a, in in some insights on what was our journey in the last two years and what do we think is going to happen in the next two years. I think the key is this conversation between the academia, the universities, you know, and the private sector, uh, yes. because that is a very powerful combination. Using data, uh, that is how you lift the ecosystem forward. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um, we have two poll questions here. The first one, so please, if you can take the time to fill them out, we have uh, three more. Uh, we can do that within a minute. So how satisfied are you from the digital skills of your new recruits as employers? Um, and then the second question is, how satisfied are you with the creativity of your new recruits as well? And if you are not recruiting directly the people who are working with you in general. So we'll give it a few seconds for people to fill out their um, their answers. Um, 
and I'm thinking that, you know, if we want to rethink, like, now we will see what the answers is, are, but if the answers are not uh, very satisfied and somewhat and a little satisfied, then, you know, if you think about digital skills and what needs to be done, it's kind of like a straightforward line uh, of, okay, we need to increase that. We need to teach it in a certain way and you can teach those, those digital skills, but creativity even for researchers who specialize in creativity and try to measure it and try to assess it and try to think, how can we boost it? This is a more challenging one to actually be able to achieve. So I feel like can we reveal the, the scores? So uh, in terms of uh, the first question, you know, the digital skills somewhat, that's the majority. Um, and then also for creativity, the same. So, but these are, you know, they pose kind of like, they put us in a critical uh, um, domain because it is not very straightforward to know how to boost creativity and how to teach people to be more creative as well. This is an area that definitely requires further collaboration and thinking both between industry and universities. Um, Mr. Cesar Wazin, you come with a wealth of experience in employability as a director of international affairs office at Qatar University. And obviously we saw from the rankings earlier that university ranks very well uh, uh, with that regards. So considering the new requirements of the digital age, uh, digital soft skills, creativity, etc., how well do you think you are doing or how well do you think universities in general and your university, Qatar University in particular, are equipping uh, uh, students in that regard? And what is the unique formula that you are util utilizing for that? Thank you very much, Lina. Yes, if I have to, uh, you know, rely on rankings, we're doing really well where uh, we have the magic solution. Uh, please feel free to contact us to get uh, the way we do it, the magic secret, the magic potion. Uh, no, I, I, I think that we, as any other university, have our limitations. Um, I'll just, you know, put a little bit of um, context in this. Uh, and I think what applies to Qatar University applies to many universities in the Gulf region. Uh, we are the sole national university. We provide the market with the most graduates. So basically, employability and employment were a little bit uh, confused at our side. You know, we, we were very happy that because we're the only ones on the market, and I'm being very objective here, even candid, uh, you know, not the only ones, but, you know, the main uh, provider of graduates, we didn't, never had an issue of employment. Uh, we had an issue of employability in the sense that we needed to know more about you know, how well our, our students are doing, how marketable they are. Is it that uh, they're being employed because we're just the only uh, provider or the sole provider, the mo major provider of graduates in the market, or are they really good? So uh, uh, an ex exercise had started in um, you know, before the pandemic, uh, where it was tasked to the um, engineering de department, basically. And that matches a little bit with uh, what Dr. Allen was mentioning before, and uh, also what Sandrine uh, was saying. We we had uh, designed a little bit of um, gap, um, you know, analysis to know where do we uh, stand and where are our employers seeking uh, to get in terms of employ em employer, uh, you know, uh, graduates. And um, I will uh, ch share just one uh, one slide uh, with you so that you can see what I'm talking about. This was what we came up with before the pandemic. Uh, so uh, as you can see, you know, the, the, the gap uh, for the future was basically uh, designed in those attributes. And uh, as many of you mentioned, Sandrine also in her uh, uh, presentation not noticed that we were surprised to see that knowledge was one of the things that were really, uh, that was really very highly, um, you know, sought for in terms of, uh, of uh, things to, to look at. Uh, from the employers. Um, we, we were thinking in a different direction. And what Lino just said, uh, I agree with you, Lina, gave uh, an even more, uh, you know, insight to, to what the real problem is that we did not capture before in any of the, the things that we have uh, uh, tried to do. So basically, um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, what we have done is something before the pandemic saying, okay, we're the number one in the region, in the, in the country, but that doesn't mean that we're good. We have to see where is the gap, what are we missing, and work on it. Now, the pandemic itself has shown us that we really didn't get it right, as many of you might have thought. 
the priorities, basically in terms of priorities, the identified issues are the same. Yes, we're still having the same issues in terms of knowledge, entrepreneurship, uh, skills, digital skills, all of this. Uh, but uh, the pandemic showed us that we are missing a lot of things on a different side uh, that are not maybe uh, very, um, that were not very clear to us uh, previously. And those are basically uh, social entrepreneurship. And they, they appeared to us not only with our uh, students, but also with our staff members, because as you might um, uh, you know, know, the university is also an employer. Uh, so basically, we have uh, we, we're, we're privileged to be in a country where we didn't have the issues that Lino mentioned about not having uh, access to the internet or uh, laptops or whatever you need. And we thought that we are starting on a on a very high note, and that the pandemic will not be an issue for us. We were able to shift to online learning in a few days. Uh, we discovered that we are this is not the only uh, skill that was needed. Uh, the well-being of our staff, basically. And, uh, you know, the, the knowledge of how to teach something online rather than just being online and it's not, not posting online your course, but, but, you know, teaching it, uh, making the, the idea go through. Um, so, basically, we have uh, identified new issues that made us rethink our whole, whole system in the sense that at the Qatar University, we have a core curriculum program, which is, a, a, you know, mandatory uh, system of courses that students uh, need to take a kind of uh, civilization sequence uh, AUB like but a bit more expanded with you know more courses to take uh, so basically we have decided to introduce social entrepreneurship in those kind of uh, things because we we noticed that it's not only about skills it's basically and uh, you know as lino mentioned in, in 10 years time we don't know what the world would need in terms of skills uh, it will be maybe needing uh, more uh, knowledge in internet, but maybe no, more social uh, also intelligence or emotional intelligence. We don't know. So we decided that or like we discovered that uh, introducing entrepreneurship in terms of um, uh, mandatory uh, courses learned by all students who start their studies at uh, Qatar University. This is a course that all first year students have to take uh, courses that will be, um, you know, ranging in, in many different uh, areas. Uh, social entrepreneurship became an, an integral a part of them and professional development for our teachers, uh, faculty members was also done in that perspective. So basically what we have uh, you know, uh, discovered is that the skill gap that we have identified uh, prior to the um, uh, pandemic was still uh, relevant. However, the priorities that we have done were not uh, the priorities that we had thought of were either accelerated, uh, catalyzed by the pandemic, or uh, uh, rendered obsolete uh, because they were not really relevant to uh, to what whatever happened during this pandemic. So basically, uh, just don't want to uh, monopolize a lot of the time. This is basically what Qatar University is undergoing now. Uh, we are trying to uh, reshape our curriculum. Uh, to uh, focus more on entrepreneurship and the hope that social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in the social uh, area, social sciences, uh, the well-being of the staff will enable them uh, to have uh, enough, uh, you know, um, uh, skills to face any uh, pandemic-like situation that might arise in, in the future. That's the best that we can do. Thank you, Cesar. That was very, very insightful. For some reason, we lost your um, uh, picture. Uh, we can't see you anymore. And Lino, also, for some reason, we cannot see you anymore. Um, uh, you know, for the other speakers, if you have any comments that you would like to respond, you know, uh, share with Cesar as well, uh, please feel uh, free to do so. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I find it really, really, in, you know, um, inspiring that you are going through this extra exercise of looking at the data further and not taking just the numbers as they are the numbers are telling us we have high high employability that's it we've reached our goal but rather you're going more qualitatively to dig, dig into the reasons is it because we are the only employers or is there something else 
and this is really like uh, you know the best way to kind of like help you as a university think whether you can, you can do things differently because even if today the competition is not very big eventually we all know that you know there will be other entities there will be other places and it's better not to be reactive later rather be uh, proactive and and start the self learning process early on i just wanted yeah, I to ask yes just to clarify, yes, thank you for pointing that out. Um, of course, there are other uh, people on the, on the, on the market. Uh, our main concern was basically, um, you know, that Qatar is organizing the World Cup uh, in 2022. And the job market was very much geared or at least revived by this uh, event, this big event. Uh, basically, uh, Qatar uh, is aiming to become a knowledge-based economy. So uh, just to be brief, um, the, the idea of challenging ourselves, if you want, you know, uh, us and Education City uh, universities, not only us, all the providers of, uh, uh, you know, um, graduates in Qatar, is that uh, post-World Cup, the, um, you know, the, the uh, panoramic view of uh, the, the needed skills in Qatar will change. So that was before the pandemic. We were saying that with the, with the World Cup, you know, this is a very attractive destination. People would come, would be very interested to come here. Uh, uh, and we need, uh, uh, you know, some, some sort of jobs that are related to the World Cup. Whatever happens after the World Cup and to keep the momentum is, was, our, was our, you know, aim uh, before the pandemic. And this is why we did this gap skills and uh, gap uh, analysis to see where do we stand, you know, in making this sustainable, making this effort and this attractiveness, uh, you know, um, uh, attractiveness uh, go on in the future while we don't organize the work? Just to clarify, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Cezar, for this. Um, Fida asked a poll question earlier whether people perceive that COVID-19 impacted the quality of education negatively. And if you look at the results here, we have um, a majority said uh, yes, some said not sure, and some said uh, no. So, um, and this is very interesting because, um, you know, sometimes it's not only the students who are raising these questions, sometimes it's the professors them themselves, and sometimes it is a question of were we ready? Uh, perhaps we were not as ready for this change that happened, um, but at the same time, are we ever going to be fully ready? Uh, I, I don't see that there was a point in time in the future that, okay, in this year, there's a like punctuated event or time where we're all going to switch and suddenly become uh, uh, very good at those digital uh, kind of and virtual uh, uh, tools and skills. But I think it is very unfortunate that we have to be hit so hard. Um, however, I'm hoping that this reality that hit us is going to have a, a positive influence in the long term on our ability to coordinate um, digitally. And as Lino said, you know, with the AI, augmented reality, et cetera, those additional tools, this may also change and flip the experience uh, for us moving forward. Uh, Dr. Ghada, I wanted to ask you a similar question about um, whether universities are preparing uh, uh, students well or not. And as a, you know, uh, as a professor from the American University of Cairo, and particularly as a scholar who's been eager on studying the context of employability, but particularly of women, I wanted your perspective on the issue of universities and, and how well they are preparing women. Because we know from statistics that there's a large number of women who are graduating, and, and Lino alluded to that, and in fact, maybe 50, above 50% 50 in, in uh, um, most of the places uh, uh, from universities are women who are graduating. However, this number is not parallel with the workplace. And as, as much as there are societal constraints, uh, uh, et cetera, is there, you know, what role are universities playing and are they being able to help break some of those barriers and boundaries to help women uh, enter the workplace and remain in the workplace for longer? Nina, thank you so much. And um, it's been fascinating listening to everybody. Thank you very much for putting me at the end because that allowed me to think more about what we, the things we worry about. And as you said, I, w I wear two hats. I'm an educator myself. I chair a department with two degrees that are accredited uh, by the US, by NASPA in the US, by IAPA and ICAPA in Europe. So some of the existential questions are always, uh, we ask ourselves so many of these existential questions. What are we doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? 
are we confident that we are doing what we claim to be doing? And that's one of the most difficult questions that you have to face in accreditation because you list a set of competencies that you claim to be giving to students. But how are you sure that you're doing what you're doing? And it's it's really one of the most difficult things in education and for educators because you say we're giving students critical thinking and then students would say, oh, we don't think we have enough critical thinking. So there's a lot of disconnect between what you want to do and what you actually do at the end. So as an educator, and I'm very happy to hear everybody not not fixate, being not fixated on specific technical skills. I see a lot of fear in the conversation about what technology can do. And I would start with that. I don't think we are capable of giving specific technical skills to or we're not capable of predicting the skills that are going to be needed in the labor market five years from now or four years from now as we admit students today. But the one thing I think we can really focus our energy on is basically building people who have the capacity to learn. We ha who have the ability to, to adapt to such disruptive technology. And that applies to both men and women. We, the problem with women's education is that if we look at where women study and what women study, women study tend to study in lower prestige um, fields. And when they go to higher prestige fields, unfortunately, they they are hit with a labor market that doesn't have enough women in such fields. I just had a student who wrote a thesis on women engineers and the kind of challenges that women engineers face, because there are very few of them. So when you go, there are very few of them in the in the university at the university level, and when they go to the labor market, there are very few of them, to the extent that there are no toilets in some of the some of the sites. And, and it, it goes down to some of these really tiny problems, these everyday mundane issues that become serious barriers. They're simple and mundane, but they become very serious barriers for women to enter into fields that are traditionally not uh, women, uh, women dominated. So as I start, I said, we st I, I say as an educator, I think about this a lot. And, I, and, and to me, the answer is we have to really focus on building the skills to learn, the skills to be able to seek knowledge elsewhere. And I keep saying to our students, there is no, we, we are now at a very advantageous point. We are at a point where knowledge is so accessible. I mean, we were, you and I were joking about this. We had this fantastic shelf of this Encyclopedia Britannica, and it was, you know, a prestige, um, a status icon in your living room. You invite people to see your encyclopedia, but that was it. That was our source of knowledge on many issues. Now you just Google it. You just search for any term, and you not just you don't just have one. You you won't just have this paragraph on the topic, but you have tons of 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 knowledge and information. We are at an era of an avalanche of information. We are not. A era of poverty of data. We are not an era of poverty of knowledge, but we need to prepare students to be good consumers and good users and to be able to have the capacity to, to, to digest, to interact and to move forward with such knowledge. So that's that's to me, that's that, that's our goal as educators. Now, I go back to my other hat as someone who's been for more than 20 years now talking to young people, to young women, who are trying to get into to the labor market, who are leaving the labor market. I've interviewed so many women who would say, you know what, I can't continue. I can't continue with this job. The, the pay is not enough. I have to do this, I have to do that. So because women have a very high, a very high reservation wage. And, and the other thing is when I interviewed graduates, fresh graduates, I, I have to say something. We worry about the employability of our students. But we are from elite institutions. The very nature of this conversation, a conversation that's done in English in, a, in an Arabic speaking um, society. This is an elite conversation and we are a group of elite universities. We are the top, we are the top ranking institutions and we worry and we think very seriously about the employability of our students and, and this is legitimate. We have to do that. But we have to know that we are start. We're not starting from a very, from a. We're starting from a very unleveled playing field. The students who come to us come from privileged backgrounds. 
They are the ones who've had access to foreign languages. They are the ones who've had access to private schooling before coming to other to our private institutions. And these are not the ones who are driving the figures on unemployment in the region. This is the region with the highest unemployment rate among youth in the world. And we're still keeping that rank, that prestigious point of the highest unemployment rate in the, in the world. And it's not our graduates who are driving these st statistics. They are the majority of the students or the majority of the graduates in the region. And we need to worry about these. And I will conclude with a flip of this argument. We started with the fear of technology, how technology is so disruptive. To me, technology is the hope. And I'm very happy to listen to Lino talking about Maharat and the, and the Google institution because technology is also democratizing knowledge. Technology is allowing someone in a village to learn if they just have, all they need is bandwidth to have access to, in to the internet. And technology would allow them to learn how to code. They could learn how to do anything. We just need to maybe engage with better platforms that will be very inviting. Every young person, and I'm talking about Egypt, every young person now is having this fantastic mobile phone. What they're doing is basically mostly entertainment and social media and this, that, and the other. If only we can harness this. If only we can adapt, in a, we can adapt to this technology in a way that would be able to engage these young people in a way that they can, that we can push forward their skills and make and you know take them to the global market and i'm very happy to listen to, to the conversation about the global market because it's true it is a global market and we have to prepare so many people who are really um not so prepared to this global market to be able to be integrated and thank you Thank you, Dr. Rada. That was uh, a lot of food for thought. Very, very insightful. If I can summarize your your perception of what uh, we should be teaching our students to prepare them for the future, it's basically learning how to learn. Right? Am I saying it right? So teaching them to learn how to learn is the best tool we can give them because change is the constant in our reality and uh, uh, skills that are required will continue to change, expectations will continue to change, but once they know how to learn how to learn, they can do that in their own time, at their own pace, whenever or wherever they are in their, uh, in their careers as well. That was very insightful. Now, there's, and I totally agree with you, I, I don't want to influence the results now, let's see, um, but you know, this, this, it is an elite conversation and we are an elite talking about an issue that is critical, but we are not the drivers or the ones mostly concerned about that. I don't want, I want to uh, hear out other speakers before, uh, before that, but, but this brought me, you know, I would bring in another question about this topic to you a little bit later after we hear from our, our speakers. Um, can we see the results, Safida? Is technology disruptive or enabling? Um, so I was thinking when you were talking about technology and how now people in different remote areas can actually have access to learning, even if they are not able to physically be there. Um, in, in the same way, for example, there has been advances in, in medicine where um, there's, let's say, augmented reality is being used in surgery. So now you can have top surgeons wherever they are, whenever they are around the world, operating on the most vulnerable and the most difficult to reach areas. And these are uh, uh, quite frankly, very enabling. And I think, uh, uh, Dr. Ghada, you influenced with your with your thought the the audience here and 14 who answered, all answered, uh, that they do agree that technology is definitely enabling. So thank you for that. Uh, Hulud, um, Hulud and I are sitting uh, in the same office on opposite sides. Actually, we're not. <laughs> That's the WebEx the virtual office, but it looks like we're in the same space, doesn't it? So, Khulud, thank you for being with us today. Uh, you graduated with a master's in public health from AUB, and uh, you were a recipient of the MasterCard Foundation Scholarship, uh, um, if I am not mistaken. And you are currently a professional. You've been a professional for a couple of years, so early in your career. Um, I'd like to hear from your experience, you know, perhaps as the old student who is now a professional, reflecting back on what you learned, 
how well do you think uh, uh, the you know universities responded to those digital challenges and transformation that are needed? How much do you believe that the university equipped you uh, in those skills? And what are the particular things that you experience throughout your university and your through perhaps your uh, your funders as well uh, that enabled you to be a strong candidate in today's uh, um, working market? Uh, thank you, Lina. Uh, basically, I just want to start by saying that, uh, like, I have a couple of privileges that distinguish me from the average graduate, uh, the average AB graduate. First of all, is that I'm a scholarship recipient from the Master Count Foundation, which is not limited only to providing courses, which involves a lot of coaching, internships, opportunities, and trainings. Uh, which is basically walking the extra mile that I will discuss later uh, uh, that I think every university student uh, should have access to. Additionally, I'm a graduate of a professional program. Uh, so the Masters in Public Health is a professional program. So is by its nature a program that is graduating people to be involved in the labor market compared to other degrees that are maybe more academic, etc. Uh, so, to begin with, uh, I think uh, uh, most of what I was equipped with uh, was not through theory courses because, like, as much as theory is important, uh, much of uh, wh what made me a distinguished candidate for, for employers is blended courses, courses that involve uh, uh, like field work, etc., which also involve collaboration with employers in order to uh, like uh, uh, kind of a consultancy or an internship on a specific project. So such courses or such method of teaching, they do not only teach you like theory and courses and knowledge that you can always learn, but also skills that are really important uh, to be uh, differentiated from others that have the same degree, etc. Uh, so basically, uh, I learned program management, budgeting, uh, leadership skills, uh, working in teams, working individually, managing teams, all during my university years, which is a, a privilege that I believe most students didn't have. Uh, so basically, I think uh, the, the curriculum uh, at any university, but at AUB in specific, involves uh, like a lot of uh, a lot of skills that are really important uh, to make you a distinguished candidate for employers but it's not enough like uh, my, my scholarship provided me with the extra mile or the extra uh, knowledge that is needed uh, for the labor market but uh, the average AB student or the average university student is not provided with such skills like uh, not only like uh, technological skills and digital skills, which are really important, but I, I think nowadays, like, especially like as uh, as Dr. Gada was saying, we mostly come from an elite background. We mostly had access uh, to digital means from an early age, etc. And in university, we mostly even before the pandemic, we will we were using uh, a lot of digital teaching and digital skills. Some courses were blended, et cetera, et cetera, even before the pandemic. So uh, for people who are not specialized in STEM, I, I think AUB and other universities of similar rank are doing fine. But when it comes to skills that employers are looking for, such as, such as like program management, such as leadership, such as teamwork, uh, budgeting, these needs to be instituted institutionalized in a better way because like uh, uh, like if you want to be involved in any kind of career in any field these are really essential and not everyone had access to them in university which makes it really hard to make it in an entry-level job to begin with 
Thank you, Khulud. Uh, this is uh, uh, really, really insightful, and I uh, I hear where you're coming from uh, in terms of thinking about your degree as a, as an applied one, because also uh, as a business school, business is already places us a little bit outside uh, uh, the boundaries of the university and directly connects us uh, to industry. And as a result of that, a lot of the uh, projects, the type of work that we do involves collaborations and working together so that you know students can can get that. But I have to say also that um, uh, uh, the, the disconnect between theory and practice doesn't have to be this far. Today, we have a huge gap between where theory is and where uh, practice is. And unfortunately, these two need to be feeding each other much more strongly. And part of the blame is on scholars as well. And, and there has been even literature written about that, about the scholars uh, sitting in their ivory towers uh, and other literature about the engaged scholar and the kind of role that we as scholars can play in bridging between what we what is it that we are studying in a critical way and how does it apply to real life and how can people benefit uh, uh, from it? So I think this is kind of a collaborative effort that needs uh, requires a lot of uh, extra input and more focus from the side of academic as well in order to make sure that we start uh, bridging that. Uh, I have to say myself, uh, uh, Fida Afuni, Dr. Afuni as well, and, and uh, several of our colleagues, some of which are here in attendance, we tend to refer to ourselves as scholar activists as well, because we see that our role shouldn't be only limited to the academic uh, realm, and it needs to be bridging between these. So thank you, Khulud, for bringing all of this uh, uh, thought and this um, critical ideas and, and sharing all your uh, experience with us. Um, I want to go to uh, Mr. Khudr Badran, who is the chief officer. Is the chief officer. And he comes with a wealth of experience from across the industries. From across the industries. Uh, we have many of you, uh, have many of you that you always send to us, particularly send to us for this program. program. And we were having a discussion we were having a discussion earlier uh, of which uh, actually graduated from our program from our program. From our program. Um, so I wanted to hear um, from you. So I wanted to hear from you. See that we can increase collaboration, that increase collaboration, higher education institutions, higher education institutions, lawyers, and in order to start, in order to start, uh, closing this gap, uh, closing this gap between the match on this match. Thank you, thank you, Lino. I mean, uh, I don't want to say that there is no collaboration at all today. I mean, I have seen. Uh, especially with AUB, and since I'm an AUB graduate, you know, a lot of programs with Dr. Antoine Sabal on internship, uh, NCAD, Harvard, ESA, uh, but those are still shy, Lina, and, and that's, I don't see that the collaboration from both ends, you know, whether uh, organizations, big retailers, big groups in the region, as well as higher education institutions uh, are collaborating enough. I think uh, higher education institutions should be more aggressive in approaching organizations and build collaborative programs uh, together. Uh, because the challenge today, you know, for us in Azadeya uh, basically is we feel either education and training are not providing the skills demanded in, in the labor market or the economy or organizations are not creating enough jobs that correspond to the candidates or fresh graduate skills. And that's I mean, whether it's skills gaps or skills obsolescence, uh, skills shortages over or under uh, skilling, uh, the collaboration still is a bit shy. It, it has to be in both uh, long-term strategies, both in whether organizations, corporations, or universities, you know, uh, as a long-term strategy. Uh, we feel today, for example, uh, the accounting and finance, for example, uh, verticals are moving into our shared services where more robotics is, is happening and more transactional uh, activities are being replaced with robotics today with the online with the digital as Lino was saying so we are moving into that but as well a bigger challenge you know we find today for our leaders in Azadeya is how do you teach empathy for our leaders how do you teach assertiveness uh, how do you transfer that knowledge, emotional intelligence, mindfulness? You know, these, these are types of skills that we feel for our leadership uh, uh, team, you know, that are vital for running a 12 or 15,000 employee company, you know. And, and that's where, where I feel 
the collaboration should be more. Example, we have approached institutions in Oman, Bahrain, as you mentioned earlier on nationalization, uh, Ms. Rana mentioned as well on, on Bahrainization, Omanization, etc. Uh, you know, we have a retail academy program with the University of Moscow. So we jointly built uh, with our L&D department and the University of Moscow, a retail academy where we get people uh, from the university into the fashion industry and teach them what, how to become a sales associate, how to become a store manager, and what are the skills needed to go up that career path. Uh, from an FMB perspective, we have also uh, partnered with uh, the National Hospitality Institution in, in Bahrain, uh, where, you know, today uh, fresh graduates are not embarrassed to become a barista, for example, in one of our Paul's, uh, Paul Cafe uh, restaurants. You know, the skills are changing, you know, and the mentality is changing. So I think by being more aggressive uh, on those collaborations, you know, between organizations and higher education institutions should be uh, more agile in following what the trends are uh, and the trends that are happening in the market and what where do we need to be in the coming 5, 10, 15 years. And I think by, by those examples that I gave and those collaborations, you know, we can enhance and reduce that mismatch between what we are studying today and what our, you know, fresh graduates are majoring in and what the companies are requiring. Thank you, Khadr. That is very insane. Thank you, Khadr. That is very insane. There's an echo. I'm hearing um, it's gone now. Um, so I would like to invite also our other speakers. If you would like to comment on uh, uh, what Khadr just mentioned, would you like to add to uh, the conversation? Yes, Hamza. So, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's super on point. Um, I believe that. To be able uh, to build what we are talking about, uh, resilient people, employable people, uh, the, the issue really for higher ed institutions is really a change of mindset and also building our own capabilities uh, to become ourselves. Uh, uh, I think COVID uh, we brought great sense uh, on that side. Um, I also think that. Uh, we, we need to start thinking of uh, total experiences or global experiences as we uh, build and design our program or our strategy. So it's not only the student experience or the employee experience, it's really a total experience as an ecosystem uh, because um, everyone, I mean, in this, in this employability ecosystem, everyone should be involved, actively involved as a stakeholder uh, around the realization of the of, of the goals and the objectives, uh, so the higher ed institution becomes a kind of ecosystem facilitator, uh, and not just a provider of knowledge. Mm. Uh, it's more like yeah, being more aggressive. I would say not really aggressive, but more facilitative <laughs> in, in, the in the ecosystem. So uh, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Hamza. Um, and, and definitely, I, I hear you very well when you say playing the role of the facilitator as opposed to the knowledge holder. It's going back to the example of the encyclopedia where the, all the knowledge was there and it's about like, you know, I hold it and I'm going to give it to you versus now how the world is where the knowledge is available everywhere and the university can play this facilitating role as opposed to, you know, the knowledge holder and knowledge giver only uh, uh, equation. Say uh, that. Uh, yes, I, I I like also to uh, to comment on uh, you know Khudr and uh, Hamza's uh, uh, idea, but also on Khulud, what she said. I, I remember back then when I was in AUB, uh, being a medical lab student was not the best thing you know you can you can do. Um, uh, our friends were being uh, bullied basically <laughs> for that, and this is changing. This this pandemic showed us you know if if it taught us anything at the higher education level and at the personal level. That there is no um, job more important than the other. That academics, uh, faculty members, researchers, big shots, highly cited, are not really do not have the solution for everything. Um, so what, what we used to think as being lesser uh, jobs, uh, lesser skills, turned out to be lifesavers. 
And uh, I, I would like also to link to what uh, Dr. Bersoum has said about the ladies. It is, it is uh, uh, very weird and for me, uh, very interesting to see that um, one of the jobs that is basically uh, female, uh, you know, labeled uh, nurse, nursing, turned out to be uh, the, the most important job that everybody turned to in this pandemic. So basically empowering women um, might be uh, in the fields that, uh, not necessarily the fields that men are tackling, although I strongly believe that uh, women should pierce in the fields that men are, uh, uh, you know, monopolizing, but as women, uh, not as men-like uh, uh, managers, you know, having the, the, this, this strength about being a woman with the compassion and the leadership, uh, rather than just acting like a man while being a, a woman. Um, because we, we, you know, we saw where, where we took the, the world to, with its good things and its bad things. So that's why we need a, a real feminine touch. So, but that's another matter. So basically, yes, I, I think that the universities have realized now that, uh, you know, the focus should not be only on engineering, uh, law schools, or uh, medical schools. It has to be on health clusters. It has to be on on other areas that uh, that turned out to be uh, not only important for humanity but life saving also in some areas. And I think that this this uh, matches a lot of the things that were a lot of psychology. Says I think uh, is important today. You know, definitely, we, we definitely, are seeing it uh, on on daily basis when we having leadership programs. We we have psychologists also giving to our people, you know, uh, a lot of emotional uh, and uh, behavioral skills because psychology today, even our recruiters, you know, we prefer them to have uh, been in psychology major, you know, when they recruit because it's very important, you know, psychology a, a, a while back was just another major uh, clinical psychology, etc. Today, it's proven to be really, really important in corporations today. You know. right. Totally agree. Absolutely. When I when I told my uh, my parents I wanted to study psychology, the first question that my father asked me like, how can you make money with that? And how can you have a job and live out of it? Eventually, thankfully, I was able to uh, <laughs> prove that, you know, that that you can, and there are fields in that. And uh, particularly when I learned about the field of organizational psychology and how it is applied there, it is more and more becoming kind of a necessity for almost any uh, um, field of study or work or professionalism. I totally agree. Holud, you had you had your hand up. You wanted to uh, interject as well. Yes, I just have a small comment regarding women's inclusion in the workforce. Uh, like uh, when it comes to women's inclusion, whether in universities as graduates or in the workforce, I think universities, especially elite universities, are doing a pretty fair job in including women and uh, like marginalized populations. But when it comes to employers, here when it co like the, the gap is there, uh, at least in my opinion, and if we want to be a more inclusive of women in the workforce. We need to speak about the pay gap, about the more accommodation, childcare, flexible working hours. In addition to like uh, uh, being mindful of uh, positions that of that gender segregation of positions of each employer. Like for example, uh, the UN have, have been uh, like uh, I'm a, I am a UN employee, and the UN has been working for ages and uh, for uh, like kind of gender more gender diversity in their um, um, workforce or employees. Now we almost have a 50-50 uh, employees uh, when it comes to gender diversity. But this is still not enough because if you look at the segregation, uh, like most people in higher positions are still mainly men. Uh, so to, to do a better job in this regard, I think a lot of it for, falls on employers in providing more accommodation for women, given that uh, most of the care work falls on women. So more side care, more parental leave, uh, more flexible working modalities, basically. And the Cesar is agreeing with you, saying that he discovered, like we discovered that when we uh, went through the uh, SDG five, the gender equality uh, SDG. 
uh, that became more apparent that the discrepancy between gender and, and the pay gap uh, and leadership uh, positions was enormous. And in fact, Frida is one of the co-founders of the Center for Inclusive Business and Leadership for Women, which is one of the pioneering centers that is working on, on bridging between the academic knowledge that we have and institutions and working together, collaborating with institutions to empower them and give them the tools to create policies that are more inclusive, create a work environments that are more inclusive and start focusing at what are the structural problems within the workplace and how can we change them? I just wanted to wrap up with a question actually with one more question, uh, perhaps that relates back to, um, uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Uh, Barsoom and, and what she was mentioning about the elitism of the conversation, because we are the you know universities that are top ranking in employability and having this conversation. And this also makes me think about uh, uh, another thing. Today we're talking about universities and employers and the conversation. But is the conversation between universities happening and uh, within country? let alone between countries and and maybe between countries that is more happening but within countries and i'm only saying that because lebanon as an example you notice that competition is driving the performance of universities and you end up having universities that offer similar programs as other universities and every year they they metamorphose into becoming like okay offering the same programs which at the national level is creating gaps because we have certain skills or certain jobs or certain areas that are not being taught there's no one is providing them because they're not the hot topics or they're not the money makers or they're not the ones that attract students so um I, i'm not sure what what is your thought uh, uh, dr barstum on this like what do you think universities should be doing in order to start breaking this elitism and starting to open the conversation between them as well i don't think we're elitist um elitism is a bad thing we don't want to be elitist and uh, we definitely want, don't want that i mean we are in a position that is an elite situation that's adv advantageous uh, position and that doesn't mean that we should be elitist or that we should be uh, because elitism involves involves a certain level of authorizing those who are non elite and maybe looking at them in a different way and not taking them into account. And that's not what we want to do at all. But, you know, events like this, and I want to thank you for inviting me because you, you AU Bytes are doing an event and you could just, you know, uh, do it without uh, people from AUC, but you did, and you, you're including people from Qatar, you're including people from Rabat. That's a fantastic step, and, and I wish we could do more of, of that because we know nothing about each other. Uh, we are um, members of, um, you know, a group of people interested in public policy and public administration um, started this initiative 2011 called AMEPA, which is Association for uh, We lost Dr. Barsoom for a little bit. Uh, you know, while Dr. Barsoom is back, uh, if we can allow some questions from the audience before our time is up. We still have 14 minutes. So, Fida, put a note if uh, you would like to raise your hand and, and engage and ask your questions, you are most welcome to do that. Yes, and since we are a small group, everyone can now unmute themselves and, and speak. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I am back. I, my husband did something with Alexa. The Alexa did something in our house. I mean, just, you know, happens all the time. Um, so anyway, I was just saying that uh, an event like this is a fantastic opportunity and we really need to do more of that. Thank you. Thank you, Radha. So the floor is open for any questions that you may have to our speakers or even to our speakers who would like to comment on additional issues in relation to our hot topic of today. We'll give it a few uh, a few seconds I um, to see to, to get you to think, says I. I'm sorry, I don't want to monopolize all of the time, but just maybe food for thought for, uh, you know, uh, how to shape the future that's personal, that's not Qatar University. You know, I, I read a while back, like an article about how the countries that were led by ladies did better in the, um, in the um, pandemic than others. And I, I think that as we have a lot of literature that is done on leadership of men, 
through the ages history you know what what makes a good leader and it's always a man uh, a football coach or a prime minister or i think this is the time where academia and researchers should start you know thinking of um, looking at what what a woman leader can bring to the table and uh, in that perspective that uh, this is a gap that we can fill in the sense that uh, you know universities can help in uh, constructing leadership uh, you know uh, um, masters phd's courses whatever modules that are based on something different in leadership other than you know reframing organizations using the uh, four or 16 or whatever uh, you know you have through the ages that were put in place as as uh, as leadership skills so just uh, this is an opportunity that we should not miss and i think the universities should and i i'm telling you this is a personal point of view uh, that can be taken or not uh, it's not Qatar university was thinking about this but uh, i i think that it's it's a good indicator uh, that we build on that and introduce it in our courses thank, thank you, you Cesare. we have a question from uh, Aline germani please feel free to unmute yourself uh, hi again uh, it's not actually a question i think it's an invitation for uh, reflection based on all what have been said uh, till now uh, i look at um, i go back to dr shade's percentage on uh, the fact that 30% of those who are unemployed or of unemployment are among those with higher education uh, degrees. I look at this and, and I invite us to reflect, I think, not only on um, maybe what is it that we need to know uh, to do better, um, but maybe on uh, reaching out also or uh, working with all sectors, including schools. I think it's a, it's a continuum. Uh, so we have, uh, we have a younger generation who obviously, as Rana said, um, as the data showed, is we, we don't know about this generation a lot in terms of their aspirations now, or their current aspirations of jobs and how they want their jobs to look like. And we're thinking today of the mismatch between uh, the industry or the businesses and the high, and higher education, uh, probably we need now to reflect on this data related to what the young people actually want and see how we can help them achieve this from schooling to employment. And I think this is important. Diversification of, of skills. I think uh, Mr. Khadr talked about this. Uh, even as higher education, we need to think as a higher education institution, maybe we need to think how we can with schools, with governmental sectors, uh, with the government uh, lead students or young people again towards uh, diversif diversifying uh, jobs, uh, not to professional jobs. We are speaking here now to industries, entrepreneurs, businesses, healthcare, whatever. What about arts, music, culture, uh, uh, um, drama? Uh, all of these forgotten professions, these are professions. These are not hobbies. Uh, and probably this also, uh, yani really, it's an invitation to, to think more about this. When we talk about life skills also, uh, we focus a lot on leadership, on communication, on, uh, on lifelong learning, which is very important, I think. Um, but what about again um, motivation personal motivation uh, i think someone talked about uh, resilience uh, being able to voice not through only leadership but uh, voice and engage uh, their own i mean uh, their aspirations this is missing i mean if this survey was not there uh, we we wouldn't know we wouldn't know that uh, young people now prefer to be uh, working uh, from home or flexibility or they're worrying about their mental health and they're looking more into mental health. So that's, I think, I think we need more uh, and I invite us to, to have more of such these sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Aline, for your extremely insightful uh, uh, comments. 
Um, and I'm glad that you found this conversation also thought provoking and that we are converging all towards like a, a, a one direction at the end. I would like to thank all our speakers today um, for their input and their insights. Uh, uh, really, I think uh, I'm going to be having like question, po questions and thoughts popping up uh, in my head throughout the, <laughs> no, the, in the middle of the night, perhaps tonight uh, as well. So thank you again for all your contributions and most importantly, thank you for uh, the collaboration um, that that uh, ended up with this event today with uh, Emerging Group. I'm going to pass it on back to uh, our Master of Ceremony, Dr. Fida, um, to say some concluding remarks. Thank you, Lina. Thank you, everybody. This has been really a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm sad that it's ending. We didn't see the time pass. And uh, I want to reiterate what Rada said, that it has been really fantastic to get to know what other universities are doing and to engage in a conversation, to collaborate. And I think even the preparation of the conference is an embodiment of this great collaboration. And I want to thank our partners emerging for reaching out to us and for co-organizing uh, this conference. Uh, it has been really very insightful to co-organize it together and uh, the, I, I want to thank, thank the speakers uh, for their time and for their insightful presentations as well. And I want to thank those in, uh, you know, uh, the back lines, the Maria and Salva for also helping with all the logistics of the conference preparation. Um, I just want to uh, share if you would like, uh, you know, to know more or if you want to reconnect so you can reach out to me by email and this is the youtube link where you can find the conference if you want to replay it uh, if you can get enough of it and uh, you know the office of the provost who's organizing the, the event also has uh, on the web page many other initiatives that the office is engaging in we have been tweeting about the event live and posting on social media so i really encourage you to uh, go there if you want to check what has been tweeted and retweet yourself and also, if you want to know more about uh, GERS uh, and about emerging, these are the contacts of Sandrine and Laurent, and also the website of both uh, emerging and the, uh, the GERS ranking, and the social media as well of our partners. And so I'm going to stop sharing, and thank you once again. I hope that we will have the chance to have a part two and continue the conversation. And I wish you a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.